Tony, could you please call the roll? Jimenez? Prowlis? Here. Cohen? Here. Roscoe? Davis? Here. Esparza? Here. Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Mayhem? Here. Jones? Present. Ricardo? Present. McCorm? Thank you. All right, uh, 4.1 is uh, the item on reducing gun harm and public burdens of gun violence. Um, that is specially set for 6.30. And um, we'll go to uh, public comments um, on this item first, and then we'll come back for discussion. I, uh, I just wanna know there may be some questions about how this exactly got here so quickly bypassing rules. It did go to the Rules Committee, but I um, want everyone to be aware. Uh, we had a Brown Act group, which predated uh, January 1st, the change of the Rules Committee composition. And as a result, uh, we could not have the item heard before the Rules Committee or there would have been a Brown Act violation. And so uh, it made sense to have this go to council, the full council, uh, which will then decide um, how and whether to move forward with these specific items. So appreciate uh, everyone's work in providing feedback about workload assessments and so forth. We'll discuss all those details in just a moment. First, we'll go to our public. Again, this is item 4.1 on reducing gun harm and the public burdens of gun violence. Uh, Jessica, welcome. Uh, Jessica, it appears that your device is muted right now. If you push that microphone button, it should. Oh, okay. Please raise your hand again, Jessica, and we'll be happy to call on you. Tessa? Okay, so I guess the gun violence uh, controls that you're proposing are um, that, you know, we'll videotape the, um, the purchasing and you know that that does seem very weak. Uh, I I know there's um, a not a lot that we can do, but I think that you know one thing that would be great is if we did not allow gun sales in our city. I mean that's something we could look at. I know there's so many controls, and that's why we're in such a world of hurt with guns. Um, but um, you know I know that uh, I think that there might be some. Uh, ways that we could limit the sales of guns in our city. Um, that's one thing we could do. Um, I hope, you know, I know that um, I, I forget the name of the store that's uh, big five, I guess, maybe I think stop selling guns. Um, and then there's that gun store on union. And, you know, it'd be nice if we just did not sell guns in our city. That's just one way. of. Thank you, Owen. Welcome. Hello. Um, yeah, it says two minutes, but uh, the timer says one. So um, I'm sorry, Owen, it is one because we have such a full agenda today. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I, I, I'm here to, to talk against um, the possession and ownership regulations that you're proposing on here. Uh, number one, I guess, the mandatory gun liability insurance is you know, it, it, it's, it puts a, a financial burden on a constitutional right, um, which is the right to, to bear arms. Um, gun seizure for lack of insurance uh, creates a problem because basically when somebody comes on a call of a police officer and they ask the question, um, do you have a firearm? Yes, do you have insurance? You have to produce that seems um, kind of ridiculous and kind of kind of really the last thing is could you imagine if they um... thank you uh, Sasha Sherman hi Sasha Sherman here from district six I strongly oppose more taxation of legal gun owners each time gun owner buys ammunition right now they pay 11 percent federal tax along with back California background check fee and also California legislation is on track to add extra 10% tax on gun and ammunition purchases. Of course, there's also a sales tax. Uh, Mayor, it seems like you're playing national politics here and I don't think San Jose taxpayers should subsidize your political ad campaign. 
I have a few questions. Under your ordinance, would you use the tax fund if the crime was committed with illegally owned firearm or by illegal immigrant? And also taxes will be paid by non-low income citizens, mid and high income citizens, right? Is that the group that commits more gun violence? Do you have any numbers to support that? Thank you. Thank you, Jessica B. Uh, my name is Jessica Blitchock, and I'm a resident of District 9 in San Jose and a volunteer for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I'm speaking in support of the proposal to develop a comprehensive gun safety package. There is no one law or policy that is going to solve the public health crisis that is the gun violence epidemic. However, a holistic and proactive approach, like the proposed common sense measures, will reduce gun harm in San Jose and our greater community. I want to thank the mayor and the city council for being leaders in the fight against gun violence and specifically for recently passing new gun dealer regulations. I want to urge the city council to pass the innovative public safety plan before the council this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Sharon, welcome. Uh, Sharon, uh, it appears your device is muted. There, I, there I go. Sorry, my name is Sharon Jink, and I'm a volunteer with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I'm also a survivor of gun violence as my sister died by suicide with a gun. I want to thank Mayor Licardo and members of the board for being proactive to help create a safer San Jose. I'm particularly appreciative of efforts to strengthen GVROs and for collaborations with community-based partnerships to help end gun violence. And also um, in, interested in working with police and other um, folks who are working within the system to help end our gun violence. Thank you again for all you're doing. Thank you, Sharon. Person with the phone number ending 5140. Hey, Sam, 1930s Germany National Socialist Party called. They want their gun laws back, man. I mean, did you carbon copy that from, from the 1930s or what? I mean, you Harvard lawyers have a way, I could tell you. You'll take the time to be able to try to steal from somebody else. It's what you're good at. But uh, no, it's not going to work, Sam. You know, the San Jose PD, they can't show up to a call. You're going to send them around knocking on doors like Jehovah's Witnesses? Come on, man. You're not going to be able to do that, and you know it. And all this is going to do is just drive people to go buy guns in another state anyway. You think, I mean, you think because you're going to make a law that's going to have an app that's going to solve the whole thing, you're fooling yourself. And you can't even come up with the tax or the fee. You just say it's nominal, right? You just say it's nominal. It's not going to be nominal. And when you're going to be forced to buy insurance, that's like having a gun. Thank you. Uh, Kirk Vartan. Yeah, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. Thanks for uh, bringing something of this before us. I would like you to um, not advance this request at this time. I feel that it has not been uh, effectively vetted. Um, I, it's great that there are groups like Mother Demand Action that you've engaged in other organizations that are um, want more regulations. But how many gun advocacy groups have you reached out to? How many how many people have you collaborated on that actually are gun advocates to find ways to work together to solve some of these problems? You just kind of knee jerked this last week with a couple uh, gun laws that I don't think were very well vetted, and now you're driving this one through. I just don't think it's fair, reasonable, and the expectations and, and kind of vilifying gun ownership and what it makes people feel like, I don't think is fair to your community, and I hope uh, that you will uh, turn this one down. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm really for the ideas of uh, laws I hope we can work towards laws to ban uh, automatic rifles. That's an important goal I think we can accomplish. Good luck with these issues. Um, you know, back in 2007, do you remember when uh, there was huge uh, rise in deaths, uh, gun deaths in Mexico, and it, it really just exploded? It's my feeling there was a massive push to kind of corner the gun market of this country, and they were trafficking guns by the ton down to Mexico. And that process, 
you know, uh, you know, Fast and Furious ideas and stuff that is still going on. It's creating a monster now, and we don't know how to address it. We need to address gun violence at the state and interstate level and the federal level. Um, and also, you know, we have to work on our open public policies and democratic practices when mass shootings happen. And we've, we've grieved, we've closed up. Let's try to open up with our better ideals and practices. Thank you. Uh, Katie Wilkinson. Yes, thank you. My name is Katie Wilkinson. I'm a resident of District 6 and a volunteer with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. And I'd like to thank the mayor and the city council for bringing um, these measures to try to reduce the harm and public health burden of gun violence. I'm strongly in support of them. And <clears throat> I thank you for your work to keep the community safer. I hope you'll also consider strengthening gun violence restraining orders and working with community-based uh, gun violence prevention groups. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Don B. Now, I don't see how it could be seriously argued that firearms with a so much higher potential to do harm than to be useful should be regulated less than we do automobiles with a much higher proportion of usefulness compared to their risk of causing harm. The cost of a driver's license and vehicle registration are not intended to discourage driving, but rather to regularize participation and normalize accountability. Besides helping defray costs, Auto insurance in the long run has incentivized safer behavior and even contributed to safer technology so that the injury and death rate from automobiles is on a well-known long downward slope, just the opposite of guns. So I'm in favor of a fee for gun ownership and of requiring, requiring insurance. I don't agree with the proposal of some owners being exempted because the fee and insurance are not penalties to be avoided, but a small price of admission to an improved system. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Paul Soto. Uh, yes, there's all kinds of issues with this, Ricardo. Number one, there's Fourth Amendment issues where you're trying to make it legal to where the GVRO that you are able to search that person's house. That's a civil matter. That's not a criminal matter. That's number one. Number two is that you want to make it a felony. You want to make it a wobbler. You want to make, you want to give power into the prosecutor's hand to get somebody for a felony when right now it is a misdemeanor. That's number two. N number three, I would like clarity on this. Encourage appropriate notification to mental health or law enforcement of implied threats of violence and apparent fascination with prior acts of violence? I mean, can, I, I really want some clarity of language on that one. I'd like to know what your intent is for that. What is your intent? And how do you qualify? How do you define a fascination with prior acts of violence? I mean, we, we, we really need to know what you mean by that because you, that's why. Thank you. Rachel Michelson. Yes, good evening. Thank you. City Council and Mayor uh, for taking this bold action. My name is Rachel Michelson. I am with Moms Demand Action here in San Jose. I strongly support uh, council voting to move this forward and so that we can continue to use all the tools available to keep our community safe and, and ultimately end gun violence, um, our, the epidemic that's occurring in our communities. Thank you again for your time. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Sana? Hi, yeah, um, my name is Sana. I am the co-chair of Brady Santa Clara County chapter and a San Jose resident, and I urge you to support this proposal. Um, Americans should not have to live in fear of gun violence the way that we do. Lockdown drills in schools are not normal. Getting news notifications every day, multiple times a day about gun violence and mass shootings in our country is not normal. This should not have to be the reality for Americans because our, our lawmakers have failed to do their job, which is to keep us safe, and because they've put profits of the gun lobby over our lives. Local governments have the opportunity to step in where Congress is failing by introducing innovative and comprehensive solutions like liability insurance to address one of the biggest issues of our time in our country. 
San Jose has proven time and time again that we can be a leader on this issue, and I hope that we can maintain that reputation by taking bold action to address gun violence. Um, thank you to those who have laid the foundation for proposals like this and to our elected leaders for keeping us safe. Thank you, Sana. Uh, Moses Arroyo? Sir Arroyo, uh, your device is muted right now. Um, okay, Susie McLean. Hi, thank you. I'm calling in support of the San Jose proposal to reduce gun harm. I'm a physician and I'm on the board of a group of physicians and medical students called Scrubs Addressing the Firearm Epidemic, also known as SAFE. And we agree that a public health approach is required to identify and address risk factors for firearm injury. Innovation is also required. We support the proposal for firearm liability insurance. Insurance-based mechanisms are already used in the auto industry to incentivize safe behavior. Firearm liability insurance plans have the potential to similarly incentivize safe behavior with firearms. Insurers could, for example, offer lower premiums for owners who submit documentation of secure firearm storage. We applaud your efforts on these innovative measures. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Ms. or Mr. Swanson. Hi, this is Eric Swanson. I'm the pastor of the West Oak Presbyterian Church, a member of PACT, uh, also CIV, Community Interfaith Voice. And we, so, we see the reports time after time, shooting after shooting. Uh, the amount of mass shootings continues to grow with, with no real action. I applaud your action uh, a couple of weeks ago. I also want to applaud this action. I think it's beautiful to incentivize safe behavior. It seems like a very common sense measure uh, to address gun violence. And it's intriguing to me that every time something is proposed, the, the gun lobby and people who have guns get all worried about their feelings and all up and uh, literally up in arms. And yet what about the, the feelings and the worry and the fear of those who are just in their own homes, those who are going to schools, those who are going to movie theaters? We have a problem. We have an epidemic. And I applaud the bold action that you are proposing. Keep going. Well done. Thank you, Reverend. Chris, welcome. Uh, Chris, your device is muted right now. If you could push that microphone, there you go. Uh, my concerns with this are many. Uh, one of my biggest concerns is that this will be brought to the courts. Should all of this play out and become San Jose ordinance or law, it will go to the court systems. And I feel quite sure that much of it, if not most, if not all of it, will be deemed unconstitutional. And, uh, you know, I'm highly concerned about the entire entirety of this. And uh, I'd like to echo what Kirk Vartan said. Where is the outreach to the gun, the Second Amendment community, uh, the firearms owners, and how can you work, how has the city worked with the firearms owners? There's so many other broader picture issues that are problems within the city. Thank you, Janet. Hi, Janet. Jan, we could hear you a second ago. Is it software? <clears throat> yeah, it's on your phone. Okay. Janet, your device is muted right now. Try okay. to, uh, there, there you go. Thank you so much. Yeah, okay, so this is Janet. I am against gun violence of any kind, but it, it really does a gun owner to realize that mandatory gun liability insurance is a clear violation of the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution by putting a financial condition on unlawful ownership 
of a firearm for unlawful constitutional protected purposes. If we're, if we were talking about voting rights, this would be equivalent to a poll tax, which was used in some areas until 1965 to restrict 15th amendment voting rights. Secondly, mandatory annual gun fees to compensate taxpayers for cost of gun related violence clearly extends the individual's financial burden of not only paying an insurance company, but paying the government for the right to own a gun. Videotaping a, a gun transaction. Imagine if we videotaped everyone who went into a polling place to vote. Please. Thank you. Uh, Mel Samowski. <clears throat> yes, I'm calling in to strongly urge a no vote on the annual fee and insurance coverage mandates of the proposal. My reasons are as follows. I believe these mandates are unconstitutional because they impose a financial burden on only a subset of the population, which is discriminatory. In addition, this financial burden may prohibit some who are not considered low income from owning guns because they cannot meet the burden. This is a violation of every American's right to keep and bear arms. While some cite the car insurance analogy as justification for these mandates, such an analogy is weak because there will be no planned non-operation registration choice. No car insurance is needed for a P&O vehicle. Many gun owners possess firearms to provide themselves with a sense of security in a city that has an inadequate police force and an understaffed and therefore unreliable 911 call center, and yet they have no plan to fire. Thank you. Uh, Annie, I'm sorry, excuse me, Annette Ledowitz. Welcome, Annette. Thank you so much, Mayor, Council members. I can't tell you how much I appreciate what you are doing. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, a member of Moms Demand Action, have worked on the crisis line, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Please pass this initiative. Be the leaders who make San Jose the model for the whole country. Great leaders don't start out to be leaders. They start out to make a difference. It is never about your role. It is about the goal. When our first son was born, we took out life insurance. We wanted to protect him. We have home insurance, health insurance, car insurance. This is not a rights issue. It is an issue of taking responsibility. I applaud you all for getting into this. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Zell. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I figured out the mute button. Um, I'm going to say this. I am against violence of any type, whether it's gun or knife or whatever. I think this is the absolute wrong way to do this. Um, you have a lot of other things that are going on, homeless problems. You got housing issues. You got people smoking. Smoking kills 14 times or 12 times the number of people that guns do. And yet, you know, I've asked you to do a, a non-smoking ordinance. I haven't heard crap about this. Um, this is another example of we're going to pass whatever we want to pass and let this be fought out in the court system. And that's a crappy way to go about city council business. You guys ought to focus on things that are legal, that you know will pass muster, and not be mired up in the court system for years and for millions of dollars. No way this should ever pass or even come to council. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Moses, welcome. Hello, my name is Moses Arroyo, and I am a city employee for the last 20 years. I ask that you provide a fair and equitable pay increase for all essential employees. Moses, I'm sorry, this isn't that item. Uh, Angela Tirado. Good evening, this is Angela Tirado, the voice of San Jose, and I would like the council to please pass this initiative. I, this, we are not taking away the second right. We are not taking away that right, but you do not have a right to kill somebody with gun violence. Many um, people have been killed because of gun violence and it is actually the person behind the weapon. It's not the weapon itself. It's the person behind the weapon and those clips 
those automatic clips that are being made. So not only that, we need to not only get insurance, we need to make sure that there's uh, training provided, also monitoring and make mental, more screening. So I think that that's important. I wanna beg the council to please pass this because we need to have our city safe. And I appreciate your time and the opportunity to speak with you on this initiative. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Angela. Sina Ramos. Hello, good evening. I would just like to suggest um, that, you know, how DMV has a thorough screening before getting a license. So I think for, for, for the city of San Jose as one of the biggest city, it is a very important that when one applies for a license, you know, seminars and testing would be provided for those whoever is applying. And I think it would be, you know, a great way to monitor whoever the applicants are and kind of like check and balance to make sure that these people who are applying, you know, are worthy to get the gun license. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, let's return to the council. Uh, I wanna thank the members of the community who came to speak on both sides of this issue. Uh, we know this is a controversial issue. And of course, uh, this is an issue which uh, implicates constitutional rights. And of course, that's a, a great concern and means we need to be very focused on doing everything uh, constitutionally and lawfully. Um, I wanna thank all of the, the folks who have worked on this set of proposals, uh, who have helped us to do just that. and really uh, appreciate uh, my colleagues who've co-signed this memorandum, uh, Vice Mayor Jones and Council Members uh, Perales, Cohen, and Carrasco, uh, and the City Attorney's Office. Uh, appreciate uh, certainly Nora's work on this. Uh, oops, I'm sorry, am I still being heard? I am, okay. I just got told by my screen that I logged out. Ever have one of those? Okay, so. <laughs> I want to thank Nora and her team, uh, particularly uh, Jenny Quinn uh, and Ardell Johnson, Kitty Zogan, who I know will be uh, particularly instrumental as we think about the next stages here. <clears throat> and uh, also want to thank those who uh, jumped in to support us very early on to enable us to do some of the work that's ongoing now, even as we speak, uh, to ensure that we have uh, something that will be lawful. Um, as we move forward and we really want to thank Ron Conway uh, and over at the Heisen Simons Foundation, Holly Kreider and Deanna Gandhi. Uh, really like to thank uh, those organizations that have been so instrumental in helping us uh, craft this, particularly Giffords Law Center, Allison Alderman and Esther Sanchez Gomez. Uh, their advice has been invaluable and we appreciate their expert guidance. I uh, also want to thank other uh, organizations, particularly the grassroots organizations right here in San Jose, our local mom demand action chapter, which is really tremendous. I uh, really want to thank uh, Jessica Blitchock and Rachel Michelson and Sharon Jenkin and Teresa Fiss and Lee Alkins uh, and all the mom demand action uh, participants who have been active on many issues, uh, pushing for greater gun safety. Uh, thanks to the, the folks uh, in the national organizations like that. Uh, Katie Duda and Joseph Arroyo at Every Town and at Brady United, uh, Shika Hamilton, Tanya Sharp, Christian Heine, and Sana, or as our local co chair, I really appreciate all of their efforts. Um, and I want to say thank you also to the, the public health organizations, the health based organizations that have been deeply uh, supportive uh, Raymond Espinosa at Gardner Health Services, Michelle Liu at Health Trust. Uh, we appreciate the county's uh, interest and engagement already on this particularly James Williams, uh, appreciate his offers of assistance uh, and uh, all the partners at uh, Public Health, uh, particularly um, Rhonda, uh, Dr. Uh, no, I'll get Rhonda's full name in just a moment, but, but Dr. Rhonda over at, uh, over at the uh, at Santa Clara County has been really instrumental for us in terms of daily gathering and helping us understand better the scope and impact and then over at the district attorney's office, Jeff Rosen, Lucy McEwen, James Kimmon Shapiro, uh, and David Pandori. Uh, Roshi Ghosh and the San Jose City Youth Commissioners who identified this as a top priority. I uh, appreciate Reverend Swanson, Swanson excuse me, uh, and all he's done with his congregation at Western Presbyterian. Uh, oh, it's Rhonda McClinton Brown. Thank you. Gosh, the director, of course, of uh, public health over at um, 
of Santa Clara County. Uh, very grateful for her work and her leadership. Uh, and then uh, our many neighborhood leaders who have been involved in informing us and helping to uh, advocate as well. I mean, Ines Ortega, uh, who heads up uh, Cadillac Winchester, Luis Martinez at, uh, at San, in the Santee neighborhood, uh, and many other community leaders and other neighborhoods have been participating in Edenvale and Guadalupe, Washington, throughout our city. Uh, I, I also really want to thank the members of our team at this at, uh, the mayor's office, who've been working on this for, for quite a while now, Paul Pereira, Chris Rutane, and Christina Guimera, appreciate all of their support and their hard work. Uh, so what we have here are several proposals and uh, appreciate the feedback we've gotten from city staff, particularly uh, Chief Mata uh, and his team, as well as uh, Nora and her team in terms of what can move forward. We have attempted to try to take a fair amount of this work outside the city, I mentioned several foundations that have been supportive in our efforts uh, that have helped us to fund some research work. Some of that will be coming back to the council. I think we've seen a preliminary indication of some of that work, uh, identifying the financial costs, taxpayers, uh, gun violence uh, here in the city of San Jose, about $40 million. A fraction of that is attributable to city costs. Uh, and that is the point, of course, of fees is to ensure that taxpayers uh, bear less of the financial cost of responding to gun harm, uh, which is borne by the public in many ways through emergency rooms, um, certainly through um, ambulance response, uh, our emergency fire, uh, emergency medical response, and fire department, and obviously much of the police response. Uh, but of course, the primary focus here is actually reducing injuries and deaths. And um, I don't pretend that any one of these measures, and there are several obviously that we're evaluating, and of course, one we've, we've already enacted, which was two weeks ago relating to gun store purchases. Uh, no one of these measures is going to dramatically uh, by itself stop um, mass shootings, for example, or, or, or suddenly cut gun deaths in half. Uh, that's not the reality we know with complex problems. We have a gun violence epidemic in this country that results from the ownership of 300 million guns in the United States. And there's gonna be no panacea to simply address that. Like we have a vaccine for a single virus, we, um, we're gonna need a lot of different solutions. And there are several that are here that I believe can reduce both injuries and deaths. Uh, in particular, we have seen how insurance has been very effective in other contexts such as auto safety uh, with tobacco and dramatically reducing death and mortality and, and harm uh, in the case of, of, of automobiles, we've seen deaths drop more than 80% on a per mile basis as a result of good driver discounts and ABS brakes and uh, uh, all kinds of other devices, obviously, uh, inflatable airbags, we think of many others. And insurance is one of those mechanisms that ensures that drivers actually use and deploy those kinds of tools. Uh, so too, I believe, uh, with guns and uh, insurance companies uh, certainly do the research. Uh, if we had several cities going in together, particularly if we can get statewide action on this, I believe we'd have significant investment to do the research to determine whether it's trigger locks or gun safes, gun safety courses, whatever other measures that need to be taken. And of course, those are insurance only against unintentional harm, but that is very considerable in our city and throughout our country. And more than 500 deaths every year, 27,000 serious injuries. And we live in a, in a country with 4.6 million children who live in a home where a gun is kept loaded and unlocked. So there's much we can do to make ourselves safer. Uh, it's also the case uh, that while the Second Amendment certainly protects the right to own a gun, it does not mandate that we subsidize as taxpayers, subsidize the possession of those guns. And we need a mechanism that will both compensate injured victims and take some of the burden off of taxpayers who are paying right now $1.4 billion a year in the state of California to respond to gun violence. That's a very significant shift of financial burden that should not be borne simply by our taxpayers. It should be borne by those who avail themselves uh, of the decision to purchase a gun. So uh, I appreciate there's been uh, some uh, a memorandum from Council Members Mahan uh, and uh, Davis, and I just want to briefly address uh, issues raised there. Uh, 
I appreciate uh, the intentions um, of trying to find a, a bit of a middle ground here. Um, and I have no objection to moving forward to allow staff to analyze that option, uh, to provide feedback on that option uh, with regard to exempting those who take particular protective measures. Uh, there are several reasons why uh, I'm not eager to support adopting those changes now. Uh, I think what we're going to learn as we get feedback from staff is that there are likely to be very significant Prop 26 issues with regard to fees. There are likely to be issues with regard to state preemption over registries. I think there are significant implementation challenges. Uh, what I've tried to put together in consultation with many other experts is something that would not require city staff uh, an excessive amount of city staff to be out there uh, going out, ensuring that people are complying in various ways and making it as simple as possible and leaving that compliance uh, monitoring to insurance companies. And ultimately when a police officer uh, encounters somebody who has a gun and asks the question, for example, if they're responding in a domestic violence call. And as they always ask, is there a gun in the home? Uh, when they get that response and they're able to uh, see the gun and they ask whether or not there's insurance or a fee gun, gun um, owner who simply has not complied with the law uh, would be subjected to having the gun seized at least temporarily. Uh, and that is um, a very simple way of enforcing this. Uh, we're not going to have officers running around, running into people's homes. We're not going to have them engaging in extensive uh, searching of any kind uh, beyond their ordinary duties, uh, what they do every single day. And that's a way for us to be able to uh, enforce simply with very little uh, uh, use of city resources. And ultimately, the fees will help to compensate uh, the city for the processing of some of those fees. Uh, so uh, I appreciate the, the input, and I think we'll get more feedback from staff as we consider the proposal in Councilmember Mayhan and, and Davis's memorandum. Uh, but I would suggest we don't adopt it today, but rather simply have staff give us feedback. All right, uh, Vice Mayor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and I want to thank you. Uh, you, th you thanked a lot of people, but I know that uh, you've taken a leadership position in addressing the, the issues around uh, gun violence and the, the harm that guns have caused our community. And it's not a knee-jerk reaction. You've been at this for a while, and I've been in there with you. And so I just want to acknowledge your leadership in, in being out in the forefront of trying to do something. And uh, I know some of the opposition is that uh, this is not going to work or it's not going to um, get through, make it through the courts. But I'm a believer on this issue that we have to try anything and everything to reduce gun violence and the harm that guns um, cause our community. Uh, I wish we can do more. You know. I feel that the federal government has failed in, in providing responsible uh, gun laws that will reduce the, the gun violence epidemic. So it's up to the local uh, governments to try to come up with any and every possible solution and at least try to see what we can accomplish. Because if we can save one life or 10 lives, or 100 lives, then this, this will be worthwhile. Uh, so I'm going to make the motion to move the memo from uh, the mayor, myself, Council Member Carrasco, Perales, and Cohen. And I will also incorporate the memo from Council Member Mahan and Davis with one modification, and that is instead of directing staff to um, come back with the exemptions, is to um, direct staff to return with an analysis for a responsible gun owner exemption. So that's the only change I want to make in their memo, and I want to incorporate that in the motion. I'll second. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, seconded by Councilmember Frost. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Foley. Thank you. This is a complicated issue uh, as evidenced by the close 
vote of the people who the public members of the public who who called in i counted eight against the ordinance and 12 four so that's that's not uh those are good numbers to listen to both sides of the community and i have to say that some parts of this proposal are of concern to me um Many of the pieces of the components I find really uh, wonderful to see them here. And they are things such as the assault weapon ban, the ghost guns, the straw purchasing, um, the gun buyback program, uh, leveraging financial uh, federal information for early intervention. Those are all really good. The areas that I have concerns about are the cost that the legal owners will be bear we have to bear in order to support this and also uh, the insurance uh, component so i have some qu questions about the insurance component who's the expert on insurance maybe i don't know well let me That's just throw it out i'm there. happy to respond to any okay other, but let me let me throw it out there so I, I'm not sure if this is anticipated to be a rider to your insurance policy, your homeowner's policy, or your renter's policy. Is, is that the consideration that this would be a rider to your policy? Yeah, let me explain. Um, back in 2019, Chris Rattani on our team took the time to call up uh, 15 of the largest insurance companies to offer both homeowners and renters policies. Um, Roughly, I'm going to get 13 renters and 15 homeowners, something along those lines. Um, in most cases, those insurance companies included gun ownership and um, coverage for, for unintentional uh, firing of the, of the firearm uh, within their standard policy. In some cases, it required a rider to get it included, which could be done without cost. Um, if you wanted to get to a certain minimum of coverage above what the standard level was, then uh, that would cost you money. So I was going to leave it to city staff and the experts to figure out what exactly should be the liability coverage. I know we have a minimum standard for, for auto liability insurance, for example, in the state. Um, and presumably, if it's the same level that folks can get for free anyway, this won't be a financial burden. So, okay, so you're s suggesting that on my, on my current homeowner's policy, I don't own a gun, but if I did own a gun, and uh, I would be covered against if it was stolen and used in a crime, or, I mean, how, no. can, you, can you play out the insurance and the liability with me a little bit, maybe yeah. give me a scenario, I'm just trying to understand right. how it's going to be implemented, and I've talked to a bunch of insurance agents or insurance people myself, but go ahead, Yeah, because like, so I just am trying, I'm confused. Right, insurance is not going to cover intentional uh, use of firearms, um, because it doesn't, you can't get insured against uh, uh, for crimes you might commit, right? Uh, that, right? That defeats the whole point, right? Then people would just go out and commit crime. So uh, it only covers unintentional harm. Uh, and that's a significant problem because as I mentioned, we have a lot of deaths and injuries every year from kids who grab guns, et cetera. Uh, and in your policy, there's a pretty good chance it's already covered. Uh, and if it's not covered, there's a very good chance you can pick up the phone and get a writer that will not actually increase you. Your premium. That is what I've been told based on our research, because it is fairly common to have gun liability coverage uh, in the home. Now, the question of whether it would cover someone who steals the gun and then uses it intentionally, I think the answer is almost certainly no in most cases, and I wouldn't expect us to require that. I am hoping that the industry will develop to the point where it will also cover that as well. But it's not there now, and I don't expect us to require it if it's difficult to get. Okay, that thank you. That that actually is helpful uh, because it's the it's the accidental injury by the gun owner in their home that maybe their kid gets a home 
a hold of it. It's not kept in a gun safe properly, that sort of thing. Okay, that, that makes perfect sense to me then. I appreciate that. There was a lot of uh, comments from members of the public about legal challenges. Uh, and I'm not a lawyer, uh, and I'm definitely not a constitutional expert by any means. So I'm wondering, Nora, is there are there any components in this that are le that would let me that would be hold up uh, better to a lawsuit than others? Thank you for your question, Council Member. And um, our office is starting our work on this now. And we'll be, we will be doing our research through the course of the summer. Um, and and uh, if this passes as it's uh, proposed, coming back in September. And what we will come back with is what we think is defensible in terms of um, an ordinance. And so I, I think we'll be able to better answer that question at that time. If, if I could also just insert some additional information, maybe helpful. Because I can appreciate the concern about getting the city into a significant set of lawsuits. And yes, I'm, I'm sure there will be lawsuits. Um, that's, as they say, you know, when it comes to sensible gun regulation, no good deed goes unlitigated. What um, had started to get done prior to the time that Nora became our city attorney, while Rick was city attorney, uh, I know there was also somebody in his team at the time who was since transitioned out, they actually started doing this, some of this work. We also enlisted Giffords Law Center, which is a national organization, uh, if you know of Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, uh, and other entities, including um, one firm that uh, offered uh, to do some research for us pro bono. Um, I think they're mentioned in the, um, in the memo. Uh, and we've also had various others uh, national and local organizations participating in this legal analysis to really help us understand what is the clearest path. Because it's not just the Second Amendment. There are issues around Prop 26. There are issues around um, state preemption, potentially. And, and so we really want to understand this landscape. And so we've been doing that deep dive for more than a year now. Um, and what I'm bringing forward is what we think is most likely uh, to be able to survive um, legal challenge. And you know, I feel pretty confident of it, but obviously I'm not the expert. Uh, we've talked to a lot of experts who have been informing us and we'll continue to consult those experts. And the good news is we've had several organizations and firms offer their help pro bono. Uh, thank you for that. So then in September, what we're authorizing today is for staff, legal counsel to go forward and craft an ordinance that is uh, that takes into the considerations the legalities and defensibility and, and many other issues. And so um, one last question then uh, is regarding the fee that we will be charging the legal gun owners. Can that be considered? I, I would consider that a tax. But does it have to, is this a tax that needs to go to the vote, to our voters for approval? It, it does not. And um, it is, it isn't actually um, structured as a tax. It's structured as a fee for the response costs and, and other city service related costs um, associated with gun violence. So there is work being done, as the mayor indicated, there's been a lot of work done to date. And that's how the um, proposal has been structured, both legally and also in terms of um, a study justifying a fee, just like we do for any other um, fees that the city is proposing. And so that work has been ongoing through the mayor's office to date. Okay. So, so one final thing, I said that was my last question, but it's really not, and it's about enforcement. So how will, uh, you had mentioned, Mayor, that you see this as if uh, the police department is making a call on a domestic violence case, and then they'd ask for a gun, and they'd want to see insurance, that kind of thing. So outside of that, I own a gun, no uh, domestic violence calls, at my house or any anything like that. So the police aren't going to knock on doors of 
potential gun owners and ask them to see their insurance. That's not part of this. That's certainly not my proposal. And I spoke with the chief. I don't think that's his intent either, but I can certainly let him speak for himself. It, it, you know, we know 99% of lawful gun owners aren't gonna have any reason to have any interaction with the police uh, relating to their guns. So this isn't gonna be about, you know, rousting out who are the gun owners. This is about where there's an interaction. Uh, You're still on and, the phone? Oh, if I could ask everybody to mute, please. Thank you. Okay, because I can't talk. I can't talk right Council now. Council Member Carrasco. There you, you. go. <laughs> um, but certainly, where there's um, where there is an interaction, you know, for example, a lawful uh, car stop with a consent search, whatever it might be, um, that that's the opportunity where an officer finds a gun and can ask a question. Chief, did you want to weigh in? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, Council. Uh, Yes, the mayor is uh, correct. Is during our normal course of duty, if we come across a firearm, um, uh, we'll ask uh, if the owner has insurance, uh, and we are not going to go uh, door to door uh, inspecting guns uh, to see if they have insurance. So again, it's just in our normal course of duty, um, whether it be proactively or for a call for service. Okay, great. Thank you. And that's the end of my time. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your answers. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to say something about some of the comments that we've heard. And I think I've been clear uh, a couple of weeks ago when we talked about this. I really feel like I'm in the middle. And I know Council Member Mahan is too. And I thank him for uh, joining, being on the memo with me. I I feel like I'm in the middle of this issue because I see the value of guns for self-defense, for hunting, for sport, uh, target practice, for example. And, and also I've seen all the research on gun violence and we've obviously been, been rocked by gun violence in our city on multiple occasions. Um, uh, of course, and, and last month being the, um, the, well, not the most recent homicide, obviously, but but the one that has affected us very deeply. And I know that states with tougher gun laws have lower levels of gun deaths. So as I've said before, I am in favor of common sense gun laws. Um, and I do appreciate the, the call for more gun buybacks. I was at the event in 2018 and saw the number of guns that were um, were gotten off the streets. And they were, in some cases, they were guns that were very, very nice firearms and, and pretty new, but they had been um, inherited by, by someone who was not an enthusiast and who wasn't interested in, in keeping them or figuring out how to sell them on the, um, through, through, you know, regular retailers. And so I very much appreciate that. And I think it has a, a really good potential to get, to get guns that are probably not safely stored or not, not in use by, by enthusiasts off the street. So I'm very in favor of that. The gun violence restraining orders, that is a fantastic tool for prevention. And I'm glad that we're going to be increasing its use in the city of San Jose. I think that is absolutely the right thing to do. And, and in terms of ghost guns, I know that, that I think every single captain that, that I've worked with over the last four and a half years has mentioned the problem of ghost guns on the street and what they have been doing to increase the levels of violence in our city. So I very much support that. Um, I do have a couple of questions about the, the fee and the insurance, especially the uh, I noticed in the supplemental memorandum from staff that it called for reserve and retired police officers to be exempt as well. I, I understand reserve police officers are still having a fire. I'm guessing they still have a firearm that's issued by San Jose PD. Is that correct, Chief? Yes. Uh, the Retired officers have an option of purchasing uh, their weapon or they can purchase their own weapon. Uh, however, they still have to qualify just like a, a normal officer with uh, whatever, whichever weapon they uh, choose to carry. So that's for reserve officers. Is it, Do you mean retired uh, rehires? 
would just be exempt or all retired police officers? For, okay, so that's, yeah, that's, that's for retired, for reserves. Um, they have to purchase uh, firearms that, uh, that we deem as uh, appro approved uh, by the department. Okay, and then for retired police officers that are retired from the department completely and don't come back as a rehire, um, do they undergo the same kind of firearm training as, as active duty police officers? So uh, retired officers, again, when they, they come back and they um, want to maintain the uh, retired uh, status uh, of carrying a weapon, they have to come down and qualify every every year, okay. uh, just like our, our officers do. Okay. Or um, let, let me qualify. Our officers qualify every six months, uh, but the uh, retires, uh, retirees have to come back every year. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. And that was part of the reason why we had an exemption um, for for responsible gun owners was including that, that firearm safety uh, certification. I myself have taken a basic pistol safety course and it does involve um, a little bit of, it doesn't involve the same kind of uh, target practice and, and requirements for accuracy that, that the officers have to undergo obviously, but it does involve that as well as safe usage. And there was a very long discussion about safe storage as well, as I remember. Um, so I appreciate that the exemptions for the retired, the reserve and retired police officers, and, and it sounds like it goes very, it, it follows very closely with, with our memo, uh, mine with my memo with council member Mayhem um, about why you would, why you would want, why you would allow that exemption because they are responsible gun owners. I, I, I hope, and I, I guess I should ask this question, do, do all the officers, are they retired, are they required to have safe storage, a gun safe in their home to keep their weapon safe? All officers, as well as all um, residents of California have to comply with the law. So we have to comply with the law of safe storage, which is to have it in the, uh, a locked um, compartment. So a locked compartment, but not necessarily a, a, a safe. Most of them they are- They have a trigger are, lock instead or- Well, no, they, they have to have it uh, in, in a compartment and some of them have safes. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I did wanna make mention, uh, there was one exemption for um, those who have concealed carry permits, which I, I just wanna, mentioned that's not been widely available in our county in the past. And in fact, there's a lot of controversy surrounding the current sheriff. And um, so I, I thought it was interesting called out, but I also thought it was worth mentioning that there are a lot of people who take very, who are responsible gun owners who would like a concealed carry and who don't have that option available to them. And so I don't know if that's going to be an issue, I just wanted to point that out. Councilor Davis, do you want me to explain why that's in there? Yeah, I saw that it was about preemption with the state. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, again, I, we had I a team that. of legal experts who said, "Look, you got it. You got to steer clear." Yeah, so. yeah. No, I understand that. I just want to make sure. And then um, the other question I have is about um, is about the the finance department needing new software. And, and something about keeping the data separate from other data. I don't know if, I'm sorry, I'm looking on my list and I don't see yeah. you. Let me, let me just throw out what I think the concern there is but fundamentally about ensuring we're not keeping a registry. Uh, we recognize there would be uh, some state prohibitions on that. Okay, so there's not gonna be any kind of cross, -check, cross checking with the state like our, our guns are registered with the state when we- my, my understanding is it's only the state that's entitled to keep a registry. Okay. So And we, we wouldn't cross check our data with their registry. Unless there's some change in state law or we learn that state law would allow it. But we're, we're right now, we're just trying to make this a very, as, you know, as simple as possible. Yeah, understood. Um, and so just my last comment is that um, again, there were, there were a few people that mentioned, you know, the second amendment rights completely 
agree that we do have uh, we do have a right to bear arms through the Second Amendment, but I think it's also important to, to mention that rights come with responsibilities. You have a First Amendment right to free speech, but you are not allowed to yell fire in a crowded theater if there isn't one. Um, so we, I, I just, I feel like I'm not completely sold on the fee and the insurance. I think there is a ton of stuff to like in in the memo from um, from the mayor and co and colleagues, but I want to hear what we come back with, and I really do think that it the a couple of people also mentioned working with some other um, some other groups and not just groups that are opposing gun ownership. So I'd like to mention, Mayor, in case you're not a, a in case you're not aware, the Second Amendment Foundation, the California Rifle and Pistol Association, and the California Gun Rights Foundation, Gun Owners of California, are some groups that you could reach out to that are not as extreme as the NRA, no gun laws are good gun laws kind of people. So it may be worth it for staff and, and for the mayor's office, since I can't tell you this in private, since we're not in the same Brown Act, um, to reach out to those groups and and to talk with them because there are a lot of responsible gun owners and they want to get the bad guns off the streets just as much as the rest of us. So um, I think it's important for us if we really want common sense gun laws to actually work with people who are responsible gun owners. Thank you. Councilor Davis, since I cannot talk to you offline, you said Second Amendment Foundation, the Gun Owners of California, and what else? <laughs> yeah, that's okay. The California Gun Rights Foundation, California Rifle and Pistol Association. Okay. And Dave that. Truslow usually writes in about these issues. I didn't have a chance to see if I just read through the letters to the public. I didn't see if he wrote one. He did write one before um, in on the 15th for item 4.2. And he is a very knowledgeable and very responsible gun owner. He was actually one of my instructors for my pistol safety course. So he would be one to reach out to who would who would know. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that. And we'll, we'll follow up on the suggestions. I, I do want to clarify that I think uh, organizations like uh, Mon Community Action every town would certainly not clear, characterize themselves as being anti-gun ownership organizations. Um, they, they promote gun safety legislation, but they're not anti-ownership, uh, at least to my knowledge. Um, Councilmember Esparza. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had uh, some questions. Um, <clears throat> so I'm interested in looking at some, the legality of some of the items in the proposal. Um, and, and I am supportive of many of the items, but I have some questions. So specifically around the recommendation to broaden the authority to search a subject's residence to ensure compliance of gun violence restraining orders. So currently a search warrant is required to conduct a search for compliance of gun violence restraining orders. And so in our effort to reduce gun violence, which I'm supportive of, and obviously this has personally affected my family um, and affects um, you know, the whole city, um, but especially I have a lot of particular violence in my neighborhood. So I just wanna be sure that we're careful not to implement policies that can be used or perceived to be used in a way that targets individuals because um, their rights might be impacted by these policies. So I, I'm looking for a clarification right. on how this proposal would look to expand authority for searches to ensure compliance. Are we looking to expand authority beyond needing a search warrant to ensure compliance? And how would this expanded authority be applied once a gun violence restraining order was issued? Yeah. Um... All important questions. So, as you as you know, what we're what is suggested there is advocacy for changes in state legislation. So, as you know, we cannot unilaterally decide um, what exactly a gun violence restraining order can or cannot do. Um, becomes ultimately a creature 
of state law. Uh, what I understand to be a concern um, is that gun violence restraining orders currently um, are, are fashioned so that it's very difficult to determine whether or not someone is truly complying. Uh, the average gun owner in the United States has more than five guns. Um, so when a gun violence restraining order is issued by a court uh, and someone says, okay, here's my gun, <laughs> the police have no means of determining, oh, is that the only gun you got? <laughs> um, and what about the other four guns? So uh, obviously a search warrant is an order from a judge, it's a court order. A gun violence restraining order is an order from a court as well. Uh, and the question is whether or not uh, and through state law, we can ensure proper findings are inserted in every gun violence restraining order that will justify a search to ensure compliance. So either way okay. you need, either way you need a court order. Okay, um, that's helpful because I was really concerned about warrantless searches, right? Obviously that would um, be a concern um, and would be unconstitutional. So I have a, a question also about the fees. So, um, or actually, let me back up. So what are the costs involved? And is that what's going to happen after, you know, if this is approved tonight, yeah. the work in the ensuing months would be to determine the actual costs to administer this program? Uh, yeah, the cost which we can recover under Prop 26, and Norm may want to weigh in here, but it's really only the costs that are incurred by the public agencies in responding to gun violence. And what you see in that supplemental memorandum that was submitted, the attachment is a, a very summary statement from uh, an organization, Pirate Pacific Institute, uh, that's, that has done the analysis in other jurisdictions, determined that it's about $40 million of cost to include the city and the county and other public agencies. Uh, the city, of course, would just be a fraction of that. And so the most that we could charge under Prop 26 would be essentially uh, dividing that number by the number of uh, people with guns. That is calculation that will be coming back. Um, and I, I would expect that this is not going to be a number that's going to be much more than, you know, 25 or 30 bucks. And um, do we know how many gun owners there are in San Jose? Uh, that is a, I, I know that we have a very clear idea of how many guns have been purchased in the city of San Jose or by San Jose residents since 2001. Determine the precise number of gun owners is harder because, again, we don't have a gun registry. Uh, but we can do, and I think you'll hear this in the fall, um, the expert analyst that we've hired uh, has different ways of making that estimate uh, and being able to cross-check that against other sources to ensure that we are, uh, we're being accurate. Okay. And um, so in as we are looking at the costs, taking the $40 million estimate by another agency, and then we would take that estimate and divide it by the number of people with guns, which we don't know, which we would use a consultant to determine what that would be. Then yeah. we come up with cost. So how would we administer it here at the city? Yeah, first the numerator is gonna be quite a bit lower than 40 million. It's gonna be a fraction of that because a lot of the cost is on the county side, as you know, with emergency rooms and so forth. Uh, and then, so we come up with the cost, and then uh, it would be, uh, I believe it was the Department of Finance, is that what, uh, Dave? Do you happen to be on the line? I believe it was the Department of Finance that would be processing uh, the, uh, the actual uh, payments. Mayor Licardo, this is Luz Gafresi, how Assistant Director of Finance. I can answer that for you. Oh, thank you, Luz. Yeah, thank you. So the Finance Department would be taking over the management of the key, key collection. So we would, we contemplate that we would be issuing a procurement for a dedicated piece of software, a very straightforward, simple app that would provide a web portal for gun owners to simply log in register their guns, do whatever self-reporting or self-attestation is required. Uh, we would take that information, make sure that that data is airlocked. And so that's why we want to make sure that procurement process, as well as a subsequent testing, uh, implementation and deployment process is fairly air, and I keep using the word airlocked deliberately because it is very sensitive information. And although our city data is always protected, this is particularly sensitive. So we want to be careful about 
So we would take on the management of invoicing for that. We would actually provide the initial opportunity they would be able to pay um, uh, right then and there as they are able, as our residents and businesses are able to do with many of our fees and taxes. And then we would invoice them on an annual basis. We would also be in charge of processing any exemptions, any waivers, any considerations like that. And if, and if required and if allowed to by whatever a council determines uh, as part of this action, we would also be doing collections. Thank you. And Luce, are there any examples of any other um, government agencies storing and maintaining records of all gun owners, airlocking them um, within their jurisdictions? That's not something I know offhand, uh, council member, but I can certainly provide that information and look that up for you. Okay, thank you. I'd be interested in, um, in who else was doing that. Um, so, um, so I have a question again on the fees. So on Prop 26, so we, you know, there's a huge need on the mental health costs. Um, and I think we see that many times. We certainly have seen that in some notorious um, gun deaths in our city. Um, and, but we're not allowed to use funds from these fees to pay for mental health. Is that correct? We can well, only if, use them if for we're our city. If we're providing mental health services to victims, yes. So in this case, I think you would say, hey, it should be the county, right? That would be probably getting compensated. So we've had some several conversations with the county and particularly James Williams, Supervisor Chavez, others uh, about the county's participation. And there's certainly, uh, James Williams is very interested particularly in getting involved in the, in the legal work here um, because there's, they see the, the benefit for them certainly into the community. Yeah, and, and one of the things, you know, I, I, I think has been illustrated time after time is the need for mental health services in order to prevent a shooter from <clears throat> taking that horrible final step right? There's no coming back from taking someone's life. And right. so, um, so on that, um, it's not providing additional mental health to people in crisis so that they don't shoot someone um, is not something the city is in the business doing in. So we are not allowed by Prop 26 to use fee fu funds from fees to pay for mental health services. I, that's what I'd like some clarity on. Yeah. To, to people in crisis so, so that we don't have a shooting, a mass shooting or otherwise, or a workplace shooting or um, yeah. DV or, yeah. To my knowledge, it would not fund prevention, um, but I'll allow in order to really lean on that. Uh, I, obviously I'm not the top 26 expert, but from what I'm hearing, it is really for response. Okay. So emergency medical response, obviously, the fire department, police, et cetera. Okay. And then um, I have some questions on the insurance proposal, and I do want to thank your office. I think, um, you know, we had some differences in 2019, and you and your staff have put in a lot of work um, to, um, to be more surgical. Um, and so I have... Um, some questions. So um, can you explain how, what the process would be for low income people? And in my district, I can think of in particular, many seniors on a fixed income um, that do own guns and they're lawfully, lawfully right. owning guns in my district, but they're low income because of that, right? And so right. How, what, it, what would the process be for them to get a waiver for an annual fee and insurance requirement? You know, when I had this conversation with Rick about a year and a half ago, you know, he immediately pointed us to a, a standard form that litigants fill out when they want to um, be able to file a lawsuit in civil court and they can't afford the filing fee. Uh, and of course, the use and access to civil court is a right protected by the Seventh Amendment of the Constitution. So it's a constitutional right. A fee is charged by the public and it's waived if you just file an attestation saying, uh, I am, and you can have this obviously in several languages, would say uh, I'm currently a recipient of, uh, of WIC, or, you know, whatever the various 
categories might be that clearly identify someone simply can't afford it. Um, so it'd be simply a check the box routine, signature, and attestation. Uh, and so it would be an attestation. That's right. It would be. Okay. Got it. Okay. Because I wasn't sure how that would be different from an attestation. Okay. And then, um, so you just refer to it. So given our past and current struggles in our city during COVID that we have seen about engaging with communities um, who are not uh, English speakers, um, how would we, how would these additional processes created by the city um, create barriers? How can we overcome these barriers for low-income monolingual people, responsible gun owners? Um, how would we help them become legally compliant, right? Because we don't want to criminalize folks that can't afford it or, you know, just because we're doing something unique in our city that they don't understand it. They're responsible in every other way, you know, in every way in owning a gun, right? And so I, I'm interested in, we talk a lot about reimagining. I don't want to don't want to criminalize folks that are being responsible. Yeah, it's a fair point. And the only thing I should really clarify is um, that it, it won't be a criminal violation to fail to comply. Uh, so we're not going to be out there criminalizing folks who don't get it, don't fill out the form right, whatever it might be. Uh, it's a simply a civil violation that can result in a loss of the gun. Uh, it would be a criminal violation if an officer says you have to turn that gun over and you refuse to. That's that's a separate violation. But but this would not be a criminal violation for failure to, to comply. And we thought that was very important because we know obviously there are issues of trust and undocumented status and other issues that we just need to work through as we always do. Um, you're right that this is a challenge. I also think it's an opportunity because it gives us an opportunity to be out there talking in a lot of communities where we be talking about gun safety courses and talking about safe storage practices and other things at the same time that we're talking about this. Um, so yes, you're right. It's going to take some work. It's going to take time. I know this was indicated in the city manager's response. It's going to, it's going to take time for them to even get the software and so forth set up. We'll have some time, hopefully do some planning and then work with uh, grassroots organizations. I mean, Gardner, fortunate to have their support. You know, the organizations that are in the community that can, they're trusted. And, um, and, and so then would we be, Luce just mentioned collections. So how would we, you know, develop policies that wouldn't um, that wouldn't create put people in a hole when we really just want folks to be compliant, right? I mean, ultimately, we want responsible gun owners, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, how would we create policies to prevent folks from, you know, when we're clearly going to go to collections over fees if they're not collected? Would we develop policies around this similarly to how we've talked about with DOT, with the sidewalk repairs or the trees when we, right. we were sending folks out to collections for $100? Yeah, and, and I, I doubt we're sending people out to collections for a $25 fee. Uh, and this, as I say, we recognize, you know, I recognize there's a Second Amendment issue here. And so we're going to have to set this fee modestly. Um, and because there's no criminal violation, uh, I expect... Um, we should be able to get compliance from those who are able and want to comply. Um, and I don't see there being any issue for, for example, back fees. It's not something that, um, that's, that's not the priority here. The priority here is to make sure um, that folks are getting insurance, that they're at least trying to pay the fee if they're not able to pay the fee, getting the waiver. Um, and where those, we know those who are simply not gonna even bother to care to comply, we know those are probably folks who shouldn't have guns. Okay, thank you. Um, I um, <clears throat> I know I've gone over time. I'll just make a quick statement because you answered my questions. Thank you. Um, I have a, a lot of concerns um, and thank you for addressing my concerns about warrantless searches. Um, that was a big giant red flag for me. Um, and, uh, and so I, I do have a lot of concerns and questions. I will be supporting the motion so that this can go forward because I think we um, we have we have to provide more information and some answers um, in order to make those ultimate decisions. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Pros. 
Mayor? Yeah, may thank I? you. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Forgive me. May I jump in here first uh, yeah. before Council yeah. Member Perales um, speaks? The um, the form that was filled out by the administration under the green light section on the second page does have that sentence about the police department requesting reserve police officers and retired police officers be exempted from the permitting requirement. And I'm not certain what they meant by the permitting requirement and maybe the chief can make that clear. But for council member Prawlas as a reserve police officer, um, I think we're gonna need, if he's going to be able to um, Oh. debate and vote on this, we're going to need to deal with um, separating out that reserve police officer okay. section. So we'll take a separate vote on what we do with reserve officers. Is that right? Reserved and retired police officers being exempted. All right. We'll, we'll come back to that. Make another motion on that one uh, in just a moment. Thank you, Nora, for pointing that out. And I'll let that make a motion to figure out what we're going to do. <laughs> uh, Councilmember Prawls. Thank you. And, and so, Nora, just to confirm, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously uh, still okay to, to speak to the rest of the, the, the item, correct? Yes, we'll bifurcate that section. And, and as I say, perhaps the chief can be a little more clear what the department meant by that. But you... It, I assume by permitting, you meant the fee and insurance requirement. Is that right, Chief? That, that, that's what I was reading it as, but I wasn't sure what the department meant. Yeah, we'll have to take a look at that uh, as, as Nora, I'll defer to Nora on that because uh, I'm not familiar with um, the language there in that. Yeah, I know, it's, I know it's a bit in the weeds. What, why don't we do this? Uh, Vice Mayor Jones, uh, for now, your motion doesn't have anything to do with reserve or retired officers. Is that, is that fair? That is correct. Okay, we'll make a separate motion on that. Okay. Great. Okay, Councilor Frost? Great, yeah, thank you for the clarification. I know that we didn't include it in our memo language and so, um, and, and appreciate the clarification that it's not uh, the motion that's on the table. Um, so I, I, first off, I wanna say thank you as well, uh, Mayor, to yourself. Uh, this definitely is not a, a knee-jerk reaction. I know that, that that was a lot of sentiment that I heard as well from constituents. Um, because of the, the recent violence, gun violence here uh, that has struck our city. Um, this is something you've been working on for years and, and I've been able to be a part of that. Um, and I believe I, I likely own the most guns of anybody on the council. Uh, uh, and, um, and I have continually been um, in favor of sensible gun laws. Um, you know, it, it, it was at a young age that I, that I learned how to to use uh, initially a, a, a shotgun and a rifle and went to my first hunter safety course and, um, and, and grew up really around uh, guns myself. And then, and then certainly as becoming a police officer uh, became much more uh, educated um, and, and skilled in the use of, of firearms and then uh, subsequently own a, a, a number of them. And uh, at the same time, I have always been I think in awe as to the the debate at the national level on um, pushing back against really just sensible gun laws when when especially when you compare it to many other things as the mayor you pointed out with things like seat belts right uh, I could think back to motorcycle laws when the helmet laws went into effect I, I uh, started riding a dirt bike um, in the late 80s early 90s as a young child and um and, and and in the 80s you could still ride around and most you know i know i know that my my grandfather and dad and you, you ride around without your helmet and a lot of these laws that have come into place that uh took a toll on the the public took a toll on cities and counties and emergency services uh, because of the ramifications of you know things like not using a seatbelt, and then you end up in a car accident or not wearing a motorcycle helmet and you end up in in a, in a really really bad accident um, and similarly, as you, you look at other things that we regulate, um, when, you, when you consider things like a fee, uh, I, I pay today um, for, for my, my dogs uh, every year, I believe it's around $50 or, or something, uh, depending on, on, on the, the, their vaccinations and, you know, and, and sort of what, what uh, 
care I've had or, or, or vaccinations they've had, uh, shots that they've had. And, um, and that's a, just a, a standard sort of process of, of what over the years we've looked at sensible ownership of really anything, sensible uh, usership of anything. And um, at the same time, it, it has been baffling to me on the, the pushback when it comes to, to trying to implement sensible gun laws and uh, recognizing they're not uh, they're, they're not going to solve all of our gun violence issues. And, and, and I don't think anybody claims that that's the case, but we need to be making steps in that direction. We need to be taking steps like this and, and they will make a difference. They absolutely will. And, and the cumulative effect, if we're able to get uh, sensible laws like this passed, not only in individual cities, uh, but throughout the state, and then ultimately the, the goals would be throughout the country, uh, not taking away people's right to own a gun, not taking away the Second Amendment rights that I value personally, um, but simply just putting in place sensible, reasonable, smart laws that are meant really to protect everybody. And, um, and I know I'm not going to lose any of my guns because of this law. I, uh, I know that the fees are likely not going to be even more than what I'm paying to, to license my, my pets every year. And um, in the insurance, uh, for one, I, I, I already list, obviously, when, when you have homeowners insurance, you're able to list valuables like this. Um, so I already list, you know, and, and have the, the serial numbers and all that listed within my insurance. This would be obviously an additional insurance to have um, on your policies for, for the purposes of, of you know, the, the potential negative impact other than just somebody stealing it and maybe covering the loss of the, the personal property. Um, but it, I can't imagine it being much more of a, of a step uh, for what my insurance company already has as far as information. Um, and, and if paying a little bit more of that uh, is able to help offset the, the negative impacts of gun violence in our society, and if we can continue to build on smart policies like this, uh, then I'm going to continue to to support them while I continue to be a proud gun owner. Uh, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, uh, when I was a, a, a young man growing up, uh, I, I looked into the NRA and, and thought it was a, you know, a good organization to be able to, to, to be a part of and, and people that were advocating for, for gun laws. And uh, as, I, as I did my research, I quickly learned uh, really just how polarizing they were. And unfortunately, uh, in fact, it, it, it obviously uh, has grown even more so over the decades. Um, and, and I think that's unfortunate because uh, I, I don't think it has to be mutually exclusive to, to say that you're, uh, you're proud to be a gun owner um, and enjoy sport or hunting. And, uh, and at the same time, that you're in favor of, of these sensible gun laws. And, uh, and that's where I stand. And, and obviously, it, it, I, I was deterred, uh, personally, from, from becoming a member of the, of the NRA and, and did not do that. But I think there are uh, local organizations. And as Councilmember Davis pointed out, and in fact, one of my suggestions, Mayor, because I know that the outreach component of this has come up, um, I think that might be a good opportunity to work with some of these organizations. Now, they may be opposed uh, at first. They may want to you know, chime in on, on their, their opposition to some of these policies. But if, uh, as they move forward and they pass, and, and, and I think, you know, we've seen that before with other organizations, um, namely, say, for instance, the SVO on, on minimum wage or, or, or other policies affecting workplace, where maybe they, uh, you know, oppose during the process, but then they want to get on board to help us to, to educate their, their members. And I think that would be the same in this case, that that might be a good way to reach out to these organizations and ask them if they want to, how they want to help, right, to get the word out, because I would agree this is going to be unique and, and most gun owners are not going to be aware of this. So maybe they can help us to be able to get that word out and, and, and be able to help us as we move forward as well on, on developing other policies. I don't, I don't foresee this as being the last. Um, and, and I, and I don't think we'll be the last city as well. That's going to continue to push on policies like this. Uh, so I, I will enthusiastically be supporting the, the current motion um, and, and will recuse myself uh, from the further discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Cohen? Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you, uh, Mayor, for your years of leadership on this issue. I'm um, proud to be part of, of this and helping craft some of the uh, proposals 
uh, in the memo. There's a lot of good things that we're doing here. And, and to be clear, obviously, as, as a lot of people have said before, nothing's a, a, a you know a panacea. Every, not every um, issue, every incident of incident of gun violence will be stopped. But even stopping a handful is meaningful to our community, um, saving us money and resources, but also uh, saving lives and, and keeping people's families from, from being shattered from the results of gun violence. Um, you know, we, we know that so many accidental shootings occur, uh, even in homes with people who are responsible gun owners. And this is what concerns me a, a little bit about the responsible gun owner exemption idea. Um, you know, we hear about responsible gun owners, owner owners, and yet guns fall into the wrong hands in those homes. And and in fact, there's there's even stories. You know, clearly, I'm sure the, uh, the chief Mata knows there's stories of police officers whose guns are you know accidentally obtained by children in a home. And even even though they're police officers with training, um, their guns fall in the wrong hands, and and those tragic results that occur. And you know, that's why I'm also curious about the you know this idea of exempting. Um, reserve and retired police. I mean, to me, if we have, if it's a good public safety proposal, that public safety proposal should apply to everybody. Um, so it's it's important, um, I think, for us to to be uniform in this in the application of this. Um, I did want to ask a little bit about the the part uh, about studying the responsible gun owner exemption. I don't know, uh, Councilmember Jones, if you, Vice Mayor Jones, if you had uh, an idea of what exactly that study. The purpose of that study would be maybe mayor you, you kind of recommended it too what is it we'd be looking for in that study to, to help us decide what to do next yeah i guess just to really feedback from you know from nora from the chief about is this good idea or bad idea or from for that matter finance uh, about you know is this implementable are there legal issues i've had some conversations offline i, I think there are probably challenges with it and and i also suspect that you know, before we define what the exemption should be, I think we probably want a lot more research to determine what really is safe gun ownership. And we know that's going to change. There'll be new technology emerging. And that's, that's why I really think ultimately, you know, we're going to conclude that's better to have that in the hands of an insurance company that has actuaries and analysts and lots of other folks who can figure out, you know, what are the things that can be done that really reduce risk. Okay. Yeah, so I understand. It's about more about how implementable it is than whether or not it's a good safety, uh, a good measure for for public safety. Um, I appreciate Councilmember Perales's um, comment before, uh, you know, comments about sensible ownership requirements for all kinds of things. We have we have lots of rules that apply um, to owning things for everything from cars, as you mentioned, and to pets and and riding bikes, and we don't necessarily make exemptions for certain groups of people just because they're deemed responsible or take an extra training. Um, they're good public safety policies, and I think um, they should be universally applied. Um, and also, Councilor Davis pointed out, you know, we know that places with more re with responsible or reasonable requirements for gun ownership have lower incidents of gun violence or incidents with guns. So, you know, that, that should be our ultimate goal. Um, so I, I appreciate that. I, I guess I won't ask more questions about the exemption piece because I think the direction this motion is to is to study it. But I I'm still skeptical as to its value. If we think there's value um, in this policy, to me it should be universally applied. Um, and we already do have a requirement that everyone store their gun in a safe. So I'm not sure that exempting people who you know promise to have a safe in their home adds any value to this. So uh, that those are my that those are my um, opinions on this. I'm, I'm enthusiastic about trying anything that's going to help reduce uh, incidents of gun violence in our community, and we'll be happy to support the motion. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Mayhem? Thanks, Mayor. Mayor, I don't know what happened. I thought I had my hand up second, but I uh... I seem to have been bumped, which could have been user oh. error. So I'm not, I'm not pointing. Okay. Any... I, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. So I'm, oh, no. it's, I'm not pointing any fingers. It, it's a waterfall of hands on the zoom. Screen. Yeah. Yeah. All, all good. <laughs> I, I might've, I might've bumped myself, but um, I, you know, first, let me just say, I think mayor, you, you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that these are, uh, this is an issue that uh, often has a lot of emotions all around tends to be oversimplified and, um, it can be really heated. And I just, I just want to, you know, note and, and really thank my colleagues for what I think has been a very thoughtful and substantive conversation. I, 
I had a number of questions and I have to say between council members Foley, Davis and Esparza, I think they were all as well covered as they could be at this at this stage in the process. So I just, I appreciate that, that everybody's being really substantive and thoughtful and asking great questions. And that at this point doesn't leave me a whole lot to say. I do, I wanna just say a few things quickly. Um, I, you know, appreciate um, everybody's put forth the, uh, the, the primary set of recommendations and particularly mayor and vice mayor, I know you've worked very hard to try to reduce gun violence in our community. And, and I know that comes from a very genuine, very genuine place. And I, I appreciate that work. And, and it certainly there's a lot more we need to do to address gun violence in our community. And, and I've personally spent a bit of time recently doing more research around uh, some of the mental health components and red flag laws and, and places where I think there's really a lot of potential to have a, a positive impact and would love to see us. Uh, well, we're, well, mental health is not our kind of primary charge. Uh, I, I think that's a, an area that's very fruitful. Um, I, you know, I wanted just to give a little context, and I think it was already done by others and, and by some of our public speakers, but, you know, my, my motivation for wanting to put forth the recommendations that Councilmember Davis and I worked on was that I I heard from over 300 residents who wrote into our office and, and most wrote into Express, wrote in individually, authentic individual letters, certainly some form letters, but, um, you know, raising really strong concerns and feeling um, feeling that that maybe they're being punished for being gun owners. And, and I understand that's not the intention here. I'm not implying that it is. But, you know, as I heard from hunters and former law enforcement who maybe weren't aware that, that they could be exempted potentially, uh, families who have heirlooms, the old shotgun or pistol that they don't even have bullets for, and they're concerned, it, 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 it you know, led me to really want to try to find a common sense middle ground that, that might allow, I think the question, I mean, to Councilor Cohen's question, I, I think it's valid. You know, my hope would be that, that we would at least explore, and I really appreciate the, you and the Vice Mayor, mayor um, you know, being willing to include this in the recommendation. It sounds like there's support from others. You know, explore, is there a bar that can be met for safe ownership of a gun that would create that alternative path. And, and I get that we may end up, we may all end up on different sides of that eventually as we do more analysis, but is there some level of training and or type of equipment purchased and or type of safe that gets us to a point where we'd be willing, and I, and I think council member, as far as his point about the burden, um, I failed to mention that a number of people who wrote in were retirees on a fixed income who, frankly, after garbage rates and water rates and all the rest are like, not another tax. And I get it's being structured as a fee. And I guess those are also fees. But here, you know, here we are, it's just another, it's another imposition, another burden. And I and I get I get the arguments, I, I'm not going to rehash all of them. But really, that's my motivation here is to say, do, do we believe is there research to support that there may be a level of going above and beyond that someone can demonstrate that they are a safe and responsible gun owner? That, uh, that, that could allow them to be exempted. I think obviously income is something we also ought to be looking at. So appreciate the, the conversation and the direction we seem to be heading in. I won't belabor it too much. I did, uh, Mayor, you raised what I think was Prop 26. And I assume that's the one about taxes and fees from back yeah. in 2010. I, and I have no expertise here, but uh, I think what you mentioned, I know we can't speak outside of a public meeting for Brown Act rules, so I just want to ask this question now and start to get the wheels turning on this. Were you saying that an exemption might cause a problem because it might call into question whether or not this is actually a fee, or is there something more specific that, I, that I'm not aware of? Yeah, and, and Nora, if you want to jump in, feel free. I, I think the fundamental issue is you collect a fee because it reflects the cost to a government agency uh, to respond or provide a service. And if you start creating a whole lot of exemptions and you have a Swiss cheese approach to the fee, uh, it starts to look a lot less like a fee that is uh, compliant with Prop 26 and something that looks more discriminatory. And Nora, do you have uh, any thoughts? Sorry, had to unmute. Um, uh, that's correct, Mayor, and and that's part of what we're looking at. Where is where is that line? 
Um, it, under Prop 26, these are to um, uh, represent the cost to the public entity. I think the fee that's being com contemplated potentially is probably a lot less um, than the entire cost, but uh, there isn't a lot of case law on um, how you start exempting groups of people and and the fairness around those exemptions and things like that. So we're we're looking at that. I see. And, and Norval, as you look at that, I assume I just want to confirm that um, you'll you'll test the hypothesis that someone who has certain methods of securing maybe a, a really great safe. I don't know. I don't own a gun. Um, I know there was talk of guns with, with the fingerprint lock. I don't even think those are available, but I assume you will look at whether or not there's a level of security that if, if owned and, and used by a gun owner would, uh, in theory, reduce the cost of responding to gun violence. I, I assume that's a hypothesis you'll at least examine. Um, I, that's, that I think is part of the um, proposal as I understand it in, in your memo. And so we can look at that. I don't know if that, at this point, I don't know if that can even be costed out, but we will, those are some of the exemptions that we'll be looking at. Okay. It just seems to me the costs are variable and should decline as people have more training and better equipment and better methods of securing. And there, there may be a line we can draw there, but I, again, not a lawyer, so I, I appreciate that. Um, Okay, and Mayor, did you want to add anything else on that? Or yeah, just to offer this, you know, I just think that insurance companies are much better at assessing risk than any government agencies can be. Um, and ultimately, if this is something, and you know, yes, there's been a lot of other mayors that are interested in doing this. But this is something that ultimately catches fire. I think you're going to see insurance companies actually doing this, uh, which is what we want, right? Uh, which is really identifying what are those things that make people safer, um, and just as they did with automobiles. Okay, thanks. Yep. And, and so, you know, just to sum, sum up, I mean, I, I, to me, it, it, my goal here is really to just be responsive to what I'm hearing from my constituents, many of my constituents, I should say, and try to just turn down the volume on some of the, 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 the and take some of the sting and divisiveness out of what I think is perceived by many in our community as is, is being an infringement upon a right that is obviously in the Constitution, as we've all acknowledged, and unlike pets and bikes and cars and all these other things we reference for better or worse. And I totally realize many of us would argue for worse. It is, it is carved out very explicitly and, and, and named and, and there's an entire, you know, very long history and culture that I don't need to lecture anyone on, but I just, I, I am responding to the, the energy and fervor and concern that I'm hearing from constituents and hoping that we can prove to them that there are practical and common sense ways to move forward things that are actually gonna improve safety, but also not unduly burden them. And maybe, maybe there's even a, a path there that reduces our potential uh, liability or likelihood of losing in a court of law. Again, not a lawyer, I don't know. Um, so I wanna thank my colleagues again. I think it's been a substantive conversation. I appreciate the inclusion of the modified recommendations from council member Davis and, and myself and um, will be supporting the motion. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I'd like to come back to that Second Amendment issue in just a moment. Uh, Council Member Rennes? Thank you. Um, by going last, I have the benefit of all the great questions that have come before me. So I've, uh, I only have one um, area of concern, um, and that is around um, the cost um, for the training and that exemption. I think uh, council member um, Esparza uh, has gone over this. Um, and so I won't reiterate, but I am also concerned that, that there won't be the same level of exemptions for folks and may create a, um, uh, a, a burden. Um, in, even though they, they may not um, have any criminal um, penalties, it's still a debt that, um, like any person, um, weighs on, on you, right? It, uh, it hovers over you, and um, it doesn't allow you to live completely um, uh, worry-free. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I, earlier I, I was going to say, um, 
council member Carranza uh, because we've been joking around uh, that last name, but I knew it was as far as us, but I just, I blanked for a moment. Um, anyways, um, I, uh, I really appreciate the gun violence restraining order uh, segment of, uh, of your memo, um, Mayor. And I know that that um, that President Biden uh, also announced announced a plan, um, one of which was the national red flag uh, law. Um, one of one of the areas that you know that I've been working around is sexual assault. But um, we, you know, since our last joint meeting with the county, I actually made a motion during that um, joint meeting. Um, and ask for our sexual assault work plan to be transitioned into our gender-based violence work plan um, because it, it really is more encompassing. And also it, it reflects the intersectionality of violence and gender. And we've, we've realized that in the, uh, the last more prominent, if I can call them the more recognizable incidents that we've had here in San Jose, um, uh, and I'll just remind folks of the this this unfortunately I'll remind folks about the stabbing at uh, Grace Church, um, uh, the shooting of um, uh, the family um, that had to do with the uh, immigration, um, and um, and uh, unfortunately this last uh, mass shooting all involved some form of intimate partner violence or some history of intimate partner violence. And so we can't continue to ignore that. We have to make sure um, that we are asking the, um, the right questions and providing the right information. And so I'm also hoping that, uh, I know that you included in your memo, uh, domestic violence, um, Mayor, um, and we have a, a um, domestic violence intersectionality, um, an intersectionality tool that was implemented and that came out of our joint meetings um, with the county um, a, about a year ago. And this in, intersectionality tool allows for um, officers to recognize the intersectionality between domestic violence or intimate partner violence um, and, um, and sexual assault. And so uh, it's one of the reasons why our sexual assault within um, couples has had an increase in this last year. I think it has a lot to do with our tools um, that we're using. And obviously we've also been isolating um, together um, more. So it could be one of many reasons uh, why that was increased. Um, but I'm, I'm, so I'm wondering if we could proactively inform about the, the gun violence restraining order um, across all the gender-based violence. So if, if a police officer is responding to a sexual assault, for them to also inform about the, um, the gender-based, I mean, the, the, the gun violence restraining order um, just the same way they would as in domestic violence. Um, is that something that that uh, maybe our chief would be open or you would be open to, Mayor? Uh, certainly, uh, Chief, did you want to offer any thoughts? Sure, thank you, Council Member. Um, yeah, some of those forms uh, already asked that and I can uh, look and see if that specific uh, intersectionality tool uh, that you are referring to already has that, uh, but yeah, that would be something that we can add if it's not ready already there. Yes, one, one of the commitments that I have from your um, staff chief is that this intersectionality tool will also be applied to sexual assault cases. Currently, it's only um, being used within um, domestic violence or intimate partner violence calls and not sexual assault. And so we're missing, you know, that that intersection. Um, that we want to recognize among and this and and the pattern that exists, that connection that exists among uh, all of these uh, crimes. So I'm I'm hoping that this could be part of um, that uh, uh, tool um, as an added uh, question. Um, one of the one of the cases that 
um, comes up for me is last summer we had somebody who was calling us, um, our, our staff, um, because they were concerned that, um, that they had seen credit card purchases of guns from their um, ex-partner. And, um, and uh, it wasn't being given the attention that it needed, right? And so I think this, this, uh, this gun violence restraining order would actually allow that person had it you know, passed and already been implemented, it would have provided an opportunity for that um, survivor um, to, to make a claim and hopefully through the courts or maybe have a, an emergency-based gun um, violence restraining order. I think they, they, it's for about 20 days. And then after, if you want a permanent from one to five years, you have to go through the courts, but at least it would offer um, some level of, of um, assurance that, that this person was going to have uh, somebody cross-checking. Um, and, and, and actually I have a question about that. If a person is, has been convicted of intimate partner violence or sexual assault, does that automatically, is that something, um, I don't know if you know this mayor, but is that something that automatically uh, prevents them from purchasing a gun under this uh, gun violence restraining or, or keep them from having a gun? So if, if people have convictions. Yeah, my understanding is, uh... Even a misdemeanor conviction for domestic violence will be disqualifying, but I'm not the expert on this. So let me just check in. I think it looks like uh, uh, Assistant Chief Joseph may have a better answer than I do. Chief Joseph? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I saw your hand up, so I thought you might be offering a. a, a uh... Sorry, I had a. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can read fine. Okay, sorry, I had a Zoom problem. Yes, uh, so Mayor, you, you, you actually kind of answered the question. So anybody convicted of any felony of any kind, which most sexual assaults are and, and many domestic violence crimes are, would automatically by state law be prohibited from possessing a firearm. And then um, even misdemeanor domestic violence uh, offenses uh, would also make you a prohibited person. And that's under state law, that's already existing. Mm -hmm. Great. And so, would uh, so do you actively right now confiscate guns from individuals with those convictions? Yes, that's part of a domestic violence investigation. We have the opportunity to seize them for safekeeping uh, or seize them in an incident in which we're investigating a domestic violence. Not necessarily a sexual assault, unless that was part of the uh, underlying investigation. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know, it, it, um, th there is this intersectionality that we, we n must continue to uh, connect. I know you know this because I know that you've, you've seen this in, in cases. And so um, we have to make sure that it, it, whatever happens on the domestic violence side also happens on the sexual assault side. They're one in the same at, at times um, or happens um, uh one of them gets reported and the other one doesn't for, for whatever reason. Um, so, so that's the piece of, um, on the gun violence restraining order. I'm actually really grateful for, for this segment, um, Mayor. I think, like I said, it w this provides an opportunity for folks to um, have a path forward um, and, and report somebody who they really fear um, is gonna create some harm. Um, and uh, we don't have that right now, so I think this is this is something that that a lot of survivors um, could really um, use as a path forward. Um, I know that one of the ways that you wanted to inform folks is um, under I think informing some of our best providers, which is our uh, mostly has to do with. Um, gangs and intervention, um, but I, I do want to remind everybody that typically, and I'm not saying gangs are um, gun free, but um, there's also a, a, a mass shooting kind of profile that doesn't really fit into a gang member profile. And so I'm, I was glad to see that you were um, including employers and school districts um, and uh, 
And I think we, we must also include uh, universities as well. Um, as you know, many of the, our young adults are, are trying to find themselves in, and, um, and getting to know one another. And this is an area I think that, that can allow for, for some additional reporting. And so if you're open to it, I'd love for, for uh, you to include uh, our local um, universities or and campuses and community colleges. Uh, Vice Mayor? Yes. Um, so so uh, ex explain to me again, um, can you re restate the, your... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Vice Mayor, I do not blame you. I'm the last one to speak. You know, you've heard like the same points being made five different times. This is, this is going to be a different one, Vice Mayor. Okay. This is, this is just it's about... Worth, I'm happy to support it for whatever it's worth. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so on page three of your memo, you have communicating to key HR risk officers among employers and school districts. And this has to do with the gun violence restraining order. Mm -hmm. um, so that people know that this is an option that's available and, and all I'm asking is for us to include our community colleges and local universities uh, and campuses um, so that we um, can provide information to those folks as well. And I'm, I accept that, Councilman Burr. <laughs> Wonderful. It was super, super, super easy. The other piece um, I just want to follow up, uh, Chief Mata, I we can talk offline and, and figure that piece out on the um, on the intersectionality tool. But I think that you know, uh, in order to be very effective and not add um, another tool, I think we can use what we have already, which is that in intersectionality to I think that's a really great opportunity for our officers um, to to provide this information to survivors when they are responding to um, these cases and, and not exclusive to to domestic violence um, but also including sexual assault um, I, I I don't I'm not going to include that as a friendly amendment because I know I have the commitment of our chief um, uh, she, he's already recognized that this is this is a path uh, for that. Um, so I, I appreciate your, your continued commitment, Chief Mata um, and, and Chief uh, Joseph. I know that both of you have been uh, very supportive uh, to all of our uh, advocacy and uh, some of the changes that, that um, are creating some support for our survivors are because of the work that you're doing in your course is, is, is completing. So, so thank you so much. Um, I, I just gonna go back to my original uh, comment, which is I am concerned about what this, what the insurance creates um, uh, for some of our folks in terms of, of um, hardship. Um, I, I don't think it's you know the the only solution. Obviously, you have a myriad of, of areas here that you've covered, Mayor. Um, and I know that um, including ghost guns, and I know from our own captain that we've had a, an uptick in in ghost guns, um, especially in our foothill division. Um, and so, it's um, it's something that I am absolutely supportive of. the The only area that I'm a little leery of is is insurance, but I think you're going to bring back some information. Um, when when do you think that draft ordinance outreach is going to roll out? How, how will that roll out, and how will we engage our partners into that? Councilor, I'm sorry, are you for the question to me. Just to make sure. Well, whomever at this point, you know. <laughs> First, I appreciate the you know suggestions made by Councilmember Davis and others about uh, organizations who, you know, they may feel differently about all this that we can reach out to. So, you know, we're, we're predominantly going to at least in the mayor's office, we're we're going to reach out to organizations that are engaged in this issue, uh, and happy to reach out to the ones Councilmember Davis suggested, uh, and um, we know obviously. That, it, most of the outreach will be through organizations because most folks are not going to be paying attention to all the details and what they really care about the issue. Perfect. I'm, I'm just hoping that you will um, take into consideration our 
um, sexual assault and domestic violence organizations um, yeah. so that they can provide some feedback. Um, this is where my, my question was going. So I appreciate the, um, uh, the considerations and, and thank you, uh, Vice Mayor, uh, for your kind acceptance of my um, friendly amendment. Uh, th those are my comments and my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I, uh, I believe that uh, I, I had been notified that someone who had been trying to speak and wasn't able to speak earlier in public comment. So I'm just going to read the public comment briefly. Uh, Sarah Hupp Mancato, welcome. Hi, welcome, uh, Mayor Licardo, or no, welcome. Thank you, um, Mayor Licardo and uh, city council members. I really appreciate you guys being here and taking such time and thought and effort into um, these, you know, gun sense ordinances and laws. Um, I, you know, I was here a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the other ordinance that passed through. And I, you know, just, um, I just want to, again, um, you know, <laughs> show my support and 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 all the efforts that are made um to slow the process of any kind of you know uh, gun violence uh, by any means necessary um and i you know I, i've heard a lot of the city council members speaking tonight and um council member cullen um uh, said last week and maybe uh, this evening and, and another member talking about, you know, if it's just one life that we can save, um, fantastic. If it's 10, 100 lives by any of these ordinances, ordinances, ordinances that are put in place, um, you know, that's that's a big. Oh, I think you just got cut off. I'm very sorry, uh, Sarah. Uh, timer is merciless. Uh, Mr. Shoku? Yes, sir, uh, Jagrad Choker, and I would like to thank all of you for being here tonight. And as a member of the Sikh community, you know, we're very uh, saddened by the recent loss of the ETA shooting and uh, by all the gun violence going on. But we also want to make sure that everyone has uh, a right to self-defense, and we very strongly believe and every citizen's right to learn self-defense and to make sure that we can protect ourselves and others. And, you know, hopefully we are able to save more lives, uh, but I would love to, you know, be in touch and make sure that we can create memorandums that, you know, foster the Second Amendment and the safety of everyone. So I do not think that this insurance policy is the correct step to go in this process. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for members of the community came to speak. Um, I wanna thank my colleagues for a very, very thoughtful discussion, um, very many good and important questions. I, I just wanna ask, answer one question that I know has been lurking in various ways about, hey, if this is a constitutional right, can we really have a fee involved in any way? And I just wanna assure folks that um, this is not a novel notion. We have many constitutional rights where there are fees. Um, I mentioned before that you have to pay a fee to get into court, file a civil suit, even though that is a Seventh Amendment right we all have. Uh, a right to association exists under the First Amendment, but uh, you'll still see that secretaries of state at the state level charge fees for forming associations uh, that may be entirely involved in, um, in expressing First Amendment uh, speech. Um, similarly, uh, right to free counsel, that's another one, a uh, right to counsel rather, under the Sixth Amendment, uh, right we all have. Um, and um, up until 1964, you had to pay for it. Um, and if you don't qualify financially, you got to pay the government for it. Uh, that's a fee. Now, on the other hand, if you can't afford it, there's a waiver, just like there are waivers for other fees. And we plan to have a waiver in this case as well. So uh, I'm confident we'll you know, we'll be within good stead with regard to how Second Amendment and all our constitutional amendments are traditionally regarded with regard to use of fees and, and financial um, uh, costs of various kinds. Anyway, thank you very much for uh, the discussion. Let's uh, now go to a vote. The motion is from Vice Mayor Jones, and um, we'll take on a separate motion relating to that one very narrow issue relating to retirees. 
Inez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Osco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now have, um, we can consider a motion with regard to an exemption for police officer retirees uh, and reserve officers. Would someone like to make a motion? I will make that motion, Mayor. Okay, and is that with, uh, to uh, with the staff recommendation? Exactly, to exempt uh, reserve police officers and retired police officers. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, and that's from Council Member Davis, I believe. Uh, and Council Member Frost is uh, conflicted and will not be voting. Let's vote on that motion. Jimenez? Yes. Owen? Yay. Frosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Renus? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Uh, I've been notified there's a desire to reopen uh, item 10.5, which is, of course, uh, in 10.4 and 10.5, which I believe are related to the Berryessa free market matter. Um, and uh, I believe it has to do with when that second meeting should occur. Uh, and uh, I know Nora and Tony, you've both been in the middle of this. <laughs> So I, I am certainly happy to ask my colleagues to reconsider the previously approved motion to adjust the date of that second reading so that we are considering in August rather than July. I see Councilmember Cohen's raised his hand. Councilmember? Oh yeah, I was just, just gonna make the motion to reconsider 10.5 just to change the date to August 3rd so we don't have to have a special meeting in July. We've we're, we're working to get, you know, I, I guess Nora can, can confirm, but I think so we, by reconsidering this and getting in writing from the applicant that they that they accept that date change, we wouldn't have to try to figure out how to convene a meeting next week. Second. Okay. Uh, I'll enthusiastically support the motion to reconsider. Nora, did you want to weigh in at all on this? Yes, I think it's really just 10.5, Mayor, because that's the only one that had an ordinance um, attached to it. And um, it's just to reconsider that part of the motion um, that was the date, because the date of July 13th uh, was included in the motion, having uh, the second reading before July 13th. So the applicant is going to confirm that that condition uh, can actually be uh, August 3rd and the council can uh, reconsider that part of um, uh, 10.5 and that approval. Okay, I'll just, I'll just make clear that my motion is conditioned, that conditioned upon receiving that written, um, that written verification from the applicant. I, I think you're not making the motion on that yet. You're still making the motion to reconsider first. Is that right? Well, I think we need two motions. So oh, two, oh, okay. So it's just to reconsider and then we have the Got it. Okay. So on the motion to reconsider, let's vote. Inez? Aye. Perales? Cohen? Uh, yes, sorry, yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Okay, you can reconsider. Okay, we're now reconsidering. Uh, Council Member Cohen. I'll just make the motion to approve the uh, item 10.5 uh, with the amended date of August 3rd for the second reading. In, In condition, conditioned upon receiving uh, approval from the applicant for that change. Second. Okay, there's a motion and a second. 
Any comment? Let's vote on that motion. Inez? Aye. Corrales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Davis? Yes. Esparza? Thank you. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we're, we're really done with it. <laughs> like Freddy Krueger just keeps coming back up. All right, we're gonna, <laughs> here we go. Um, we're on to item 4.2, which is the ordinance prohibiting, encouraging spectators to gather at street races and reckless driving exhibitions field presentation. Welcome back, Chief and Captain Trayer. Good evening, Mayor Council. I will share my screen if that's okay. Let's see if it works. Here we go. That's it. We'll share it better than that. There we go. Okay, thank you. I will jump into this to save you some time. Just kind of an update on uh, street racing and sideshow activity in San Jose. We continue to allocate our essential resources right now for the problem. I did a non-scientific um, run of calls for service in the last 13 weeks, which is the last time I met all of you for the other sideshow items. We had 119 events with the word sideshow in it, and I took out the duplicates. So just in 13 weeks, we still are actively working every weekend, sometimes during the week, um, sideshow events. And some of those that have involved gang members with guns shooting uh, during the sideshow and arrests made by our wonderful patrol teams. The racer enforcement detail is going to be bolstered on July 1st officially. So they will be out with additional officers, which is a huge win for our city, I think. And the outside agencies still attend and help when, when needed. It's more of an ad hoc based on their availability. And we'll talk about technology real quick toward the end. And the uh, spectator ordinance, regular spectator ordinance that we're all used to is still being uh, implemented by the police department and supported by the city attorney's office. The ordinance that we're talking about today, it will make it unlawful to encourage others to go to a sideshow or street race in San Jose. There are other agencies who are watching us and watching how we've created the toolbox on how to handle sideshows in our city. And they are enthusiastic about this ordinance as well. A good example would be, let's say there's a meetup event of 300 cars at Capitol and Aborn, And then a coordinator walks out, tells the crowd where the real sideshow is going to be. However, that person does that, either texting or, or whatever means they do that and um, tells the spectators to go to where that real show is going to start, that coordinator can be cited under this ordinance. Now, they may not have set up that whole sideshow event, but they can be responsible for just guiding other people to that event. And that is a critical tool that will help the officers on the street. And why that matters is because if you don't, if you don't invite people to the party, then there's no guest list, right? And there will be no sideshow. So it's just another tool to help patrol um, the fines will still be starting at around $1,000, depending on um, what the history is for that person, if they've been cited for it before. And that it is, it is um, the responsibility of our officers, our investigators, to prove that the people who are being cited knowingly encourage, promote, instigate, assist, and facilitate, aid and abet the spectators going to that other event in San Jose. As a side note, if... Um, if it is somebody that totally put together a full sideshow, we have 23109 of the California Vehicle Code that we can um, send to the district attorney's office for review. That's a misdemeanor um, for aiding and abetting on reckless driving. That's a different, a totally different issue, a criminal issue. All right, uh, outreach from our department will be through media relations, uh, advertisements, if you will, and telling what the new ordinance is about and showing that we are still bolstering our sideshow enforcement teams in San Jose. The community will kept up, be kept updated by hopefully us captains when we talk to our community um, neighborhood associations and of course to council you, um, and also through our press and other media outlets, uh, council newsletters, even the district attorney's office. I know that uh, DOT and speaking to them, they are, they are actually working on 10 different intersections to reimagine 
um, the mitigating effects of how they can handle sideshows in certain areas. Five of those came from council and five came from the PD. Um, I'm still in touch with them regularly and I know that they're working hard and mocking up plans to make some amazing changes. Um, I look forward to that happening. But as far as technology goes, we are looking at new technology. We're looking at um, technology that can be transported as much more, um, it'll be more applicable in what the way that sideshows are happening in our city. They don't just happen in one place. You can't just have a camera set up on a trailer. Those are the type of things that could be problematic and, and we could lose tens of thousands of dollars from not thinking about better ways to do this. So we are working on that process right now. Um, we've never given up. Uh, and I just say that to the community members who are watching, we've never given up on you, your neighborhoods with the sideshow and street racing that's been happening in our city. Um, I can't tell you how often I hear officers in our city making great arrests, great stops, great toes, and just even writing citations for the uh, spectator ordinance. We continue to focus on the participants of sideshows, the spectators. And now with this ordinance, we're gonna be able to focus on those core people that are making the spectators or encouraging the spectators to go from one place to another. Um, with that tool, I think that it will show that we continue to work hard to keep this activity out of our city and relentless enforce enforcement from our police department. That's what I have uh, for this, but I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you, Captain, and congratulations on your recent promotion as well. Thank you, well, sir. Deserved, deserved. Thank you. Um, let's go to members of the community first. Uh, Blair? Hi, uh, thank you. Um, Kind of a bit connected from the last item. Uh, I know you've been collecting a lot of ghost guns issue and ghost guns have really come onto the scene more than uh, uh, interstate and national practices of, of gun trafficking. And uh, boy, I really want to, I need to stress the importance to check out the national level of what gun issues and uh, trafficking is about. I, I, and, and connected to this issue, I just hope we work on it and uh, work on interstate sales and, and, and what that happens, what that process is, how that relates to the ghost gun issues that you're addressing at, at these sideshow issues now. Uh, good luck. I mean, hopefully just a few examples can be enough um, and, and give you good, good starting points on how to work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first one, phone number 5140. Uh, appears that your device is not working. Paul Soto? Paul, uh, yeah. Uh, hello, uh, Captain Chair. Um, thank you for that report. Uh, what I'd like to know is if uh, there's any collection of data of where the people that you're arresting at these uh, site shows, where they're from. It would, number one, if there's any uh, data being collected in terms of their their county or city of origin. Number two, if any if any question is being asked to them or posed to them as to how long they have maintained residency here in San Jose, if they have a San Jose or a Santa Clara County uh, uh, residence on their uh, on their ID. Those are the two questions that I had. Thank you for your time and your work. I think. Thank you. Uh, we'll come back to you, uh, Captain Fair. Uh, Chris? Yes, uh, thank you, Captain Trader, for your report. I missed a little bit of it because my connection checked out. Uh, it's good to hear that, but uh, our, our sideshow incident at Stevens Creek in Winchester several weeks ago, about a month and a half ago, community was very dismayed at the lack of the police uh, actions to, to reel that in. My questions for the police police officers and the elected officials is, how are you working with state elected officials to reform state laws to correct for these problems that are plaguing us? You know, 
along with the catalytic converter thefts. One of my best friends just got his cat converter stolen. These are big problems that the city and police, local policing should be working with state lawmakers to try to solve. Let's have it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, the person with the phone number 5140. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the big concern is. People spinning in circles, you know? What's the big deal? Some people who are witnessing it or watching it and egging it on, they get killed. I mean, all of you probably support Planned Parenthood, right? I'm sure you do. Taxpayer paid uh, birth control and all that. I'm sure you guys are into that. So think of this. Somebody dies while watching it and egging it on. Think of it as a retroactive abortion. Okay? Think of it like that. I mean, I know you guys want to get rid of the undesirables and you know, all, you know, you want all this family planning, so it's one kid per household. Think of it like that, because all of you support Planned Parenthood. What do you care about if someone lives or dies? You don't. You really don't. And to think that you're going to have all these fees and fines, these guys aren't going to pay that. But... Okay, uh, returning to council, uh, Council Chair, did you want to respond? Oh, to the public comment. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that at the last uh, meeting, we did talk about how the majority of the citations we did were out from outside of our city, outside of our county. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Council Member Sparta. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I uh, wanted to start by really thanking the city attorney's office. Um, I know this is has been um, a, a process um, and they put a lot of thought and a lot of work into it. And, and frankly, other cities are watching. Um, and I think, um, you know, the team in the city attorney's office, because it was a team, uh, knew that and, um, and knew, knew what it meant, not just for our residents here in San Jose, but knew that other cities were looking to us, um, as they do so often, um, to, to see what we were coming up with. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you. I'd like to thank Councilmember Davis for working together in March after um, I had had some horrible things in my district and she had a horrific incident in her district. Um, and I'd like to thank the mayor for um, including uh, some important things that uh, weren't recognized, which is the budget items. So the mayor incorporated um, the staffing, the resources to doing this work uh, which is huge because I think one of the callers made a reference to how really um, outnumbered the police are. And so we really need to get ahead of this. And then I, I know that the police department are working with the CHP and other agencies within our county um, to do something about that. But that's something that hasn't really been recognized. And so I did want to thank the mayor for putting some significant resources into this. And one reason for that is, and I don't know if Captain Treyer can share his screen, but I know there's a heat map and I wanted to, um, to show this for the members of the public who may be watching. Um, this touches every part of the city. I know we all think we're special um, and we are, <laughs> but, uh, but really this, this, you can wow. see from this heat map, there isn't a part of the city that's really not touched by it. And so our residents are dealing with this um, day in, day out, and I can hear it. Um, and, uh, and for me, it's not just about the dangers of street racing. Thank you, Captain Traer. Um, it's not just about the street racing and the, the sideshows, which are dangerous enough in themselves. And in fact, since we started debating this, some people have lost their lives in our city due to this. Um, but it's also the increasing uh, number of incidents with gunfire um, at the, the sideshows that really in, to kind of take the endangerment of a neighborhood to the next level. Um, it's bad enough. I've had um, some residents in Calm Hill. Um, you can see all the cars in a neighborhood get sideswiped. Like everybody's had their cars sideswiped because 
of something that had happened in their neighborhood, that's horrible. You know what's worse is having to worry about bullets going through your your um, your walls when you're sleeping at night or your children are sleeping at night. Um, and so uh, and and so I had another question, and I don't know if this is for the chief or for Captain Trayer, but I did want to ask about the outreach plan because the deterrent aspect of this is really we you know don't come to San Jose really that's the message don't come to San Jose. Um, and so how are we going to get this word out? You referred to it a little bit in the presentation, but I do know that when we've done things in the past, they've been noticed. Um, people in other counties definitely notice when um, the city of San Jose cracks down. I, well, I, I, I put a few things in there, kind of the idea of sending it out social media, but I think it's more, it's also equally powerful for us to use our crime prevention unit to go to the high schools and junior colleges. When we do all these visiting with our, um, we, we go to these places a lot and just message out that this is real. Um, I, I know people in San Jose who like, even as uh, families, they don't understand that their children are going to these meetups, to these sideshows. They think it's just a, a meetup. But we know, um, we know that they're going to real sideshows and it's dangerous for them. So just educating not only the kids in high school, junior colleges, um, but also uh, using social media so parents and neighborhood associations are aware of what really is happening in our city and how dangerous they are. And Chief, I'd, I'd like to hear your um, response. We know that this isn't mostly children. Um, a lot of folks in their 30s are getting their cars impounded and we just heard that the majority of these incidents aren't in uh, uh, where the folks aren't from the city of San Jose. Um, is, the, is the PD media unit going to, um, is there a media plan on this? Sure, thank you, uh, Council Member. Um, yes, like uh, Captain Trey mentioned, this is education, uh, education to those that are coming into our city uh, participating in these type of events. Uh, and you're right, um, uh, it, it is a drain on our resources and um, you know, we're, we're not gonna allow that uh, to occur in the city. So yes, our media relations as like in the past has uh, posted uh, those type of, um, of incidents, uh, whether it be of citations or of vehicles uh, being towed, mostly vehicles being towed uh, to send that message that um, uh, the city is not going to tolerate uh, this type of activity here. Thank you, Chief. Um, and uh, and with that, I'll um, I'll move I'll move the ordinance. I think it's really important to do that, given summer's about to start. So, um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member, uh, and thank you for your leadership on this issue, Council Member. Uh, Council Member uh, Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to echo the thanks. Thank you to Council Member Esparza for working with me on this issue. Thank you to the City Attorney's Office, Captain Trayer, and the Police Department, and, and the Mayor as well for, for the budget leadership. Um, very excited to have this come through, and I, I love the slide with the current tools. We just keep adding to the tools in the toolbox, and I think I think they'll get the message that this is not this is not an activity that we welcome here in the city. So. I'm excited to see this go through. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, I see. Oh, Councilmember Carrasco. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, and, and, I, and I'll be brief because I know that we still have a long night uh, left. Uh, but uh, I'm grateful for uh, Councilmember Sparza's leadership and, of course, Councilmember uh, Davis uh, and, and, and our, our department. Uh, uh, thank you, Captain Trayer. This has been such an issue, I'll tell you. I know it's it's uh, the entire city is being impacted. I hear it from every district. I hear it from uh, residents from throughout the the city, and and maybe uh, you know maybe the pandemic, um, you know, folks felt a little pent up and uh, and they're starting to feel a little stir crazy. I don't know what it is exactly, uh, but just down the street, just two blocks. Uh, from my house, you you can hear this going on until one, two, three o'clock in the morning. It's it's a sheer insanity uh, uh, to hear rubber burning and uh, and then eventually uh, gunshots. 
uh, and and especially during these holiday seasons, sometimes you can't tell whether it's uh, fireworks or whether it's uh, uh, guns going off. Uh, but when it's not holidays, you know exactly what it is. And so, uh, so I really appreciate it. I hope that folks uh, finally get the message. Um, it's unfortunate that just recently we, we've seen the loss of life. And, uh, and I hope that we're not going to see more of it. Uh, more than anything, I, I do hope that our neighbors, our residents have some peace of mind because uh, this speaks to the quality of life. Uh, folks should be able to go to bed uh, at a decent hour and not have their, their, uh, their lives disrupted at one, two, uh, three o'clock in the morning. Uh, I've heard it up to two hours, two and a half hours, especially when the entire city is uh, up in arms and our, our officers uh, are, are running around trying to take care of uh, real emergencies and they don't have time or the bandwidth to come and break up uh, individuals who are just spinning their wheels literally uh, on corners, uh, disrupting uh, individuals uh, when they're trying to get some rest. So uh, thank you, and uh, I will be uh, I will be supporting this full heartedly and uh, looking forward to a good night's sleep. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Lorenz. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I just want to also um, thank Captain Treyer for his work in, in this area. I know that you've gone just um, above and beyond, um, and as well as uh, Chief Mata, your com commitment and leadership. I know that, that um, I've also spoken about how impacted our district is. Um, uh, my district is, you know, has these wide um, uh, streets and just a lot of space and we're far from the city center so folks just really take advantage of it. Um, I also had a neighborhood that created their own um, their own street bumps. Um, unfortunately when we when we uh, connected with the Department of Transportation we realized they weren't city sanctioned. <laughs> <laughs> But but uh, but and I think Department of Transportation uh, um, were, were impressed with them. But there's a lot of engineers <laughs> out in my area. Uh, this is how desperate people have. Uh, you know, this is to the point where people are trying to create their own solutions, and so we we shouldn't have to. And so I really appreciate what uh, Chief Mata has done and, and Captain Trayer, your your work under this, um, and especially the uh, the policy changes that uh, Council Member Davis and Council Member Esparza have led. Um, you have uh, made sure that we, um, we continue to pursue this every which way, um, and I really appreciate it. My district appreciates it. And um, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, the the sanctioned Department of Transportation pilot program that's happening rolling out pretty soon um, in many areas of our, of our city. So thank you all for for the great work. Thank you, and I want to echo the thanks, Council Members Esparza and, and Davis, for uh, pushing for changes in these ordinances, and uh, Captain Trayer and, and everybody in, in PD and out there on patrol. Uh, enforcement. You know, it's this is not an easy one, and we're we've been chasing, playing whack-a-mole for quite a while. But I'm, I'm glad to see we're really starting to get some traction now. Uh, Councilmember Sparson, I just wanted to say a quick thank you because I think I might have left him out to Captain Trayer, who has been we've been working on this since January, um, and so he has been diligent about not giving up and going over, under, and around to try and figure something out. In this case multiple somethings um, where we worked with DOT and the city attorney's office and others. So I just wanted to say thank you, Captain Trayer, for uh, your dedication to this. Thanks, that's it. Okay, let's vote on the motion. Menas? Yes. Alice? Sorry, yes. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Rosa? Yes. Reynas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye.
Okay, thank you very much to uh, our friends at the police department for sticking through with us to this point. We've uh, got some more work ahead here though tonight. The seventh inning stretch, we have, uh, I just wanna bring my colleagues attention. I think we have six items left in these remaining three hours. Uh, so hopefully we'll all be efficient with our time uh, so that my Zoom screen does not turn into a pumpkin before we resolve all these items. So. Uh, item 8.2 is our actions related to emergency rental assistance fund grant for rental assistance. Uh, Michelle, welcome. There's not a, is there a presentation on this? No, there's not. There's no presentation, Mayor. Uh, staff is available for questions. Great, and thank you for your report. So we'll go to the public for questions and comments on 8.2 actions related to emergency rental assistance fund grant for rental assistance. Blair. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you for these efforts, looking for ways uh, for both tenants and owners to, uh, you know, get uh, help at this time. It's really important. Um, I was really, I'm worried about your words this morning. Uh, it was a learning process. Uh, I really think your words need to say something a bit more that we can better work on local ideas to, uh, to refine, to, to better define the state process at this time. That it sounds like the state process is offering to help us out and to not work towards those good goals. I understand that uh, we, we have to practice good principled things, uh, but there's simply ways that we have a, a higher calling to, to discuss at this time and how things can be open and clear to people so they don't become confused and scared and, and left out. Thank you. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, this is, it, it, it has my concern because I, this is going to be the Band-Aid, okay? But like I said, we have 400,000 people coming into this area in San Jose and it's not being talked about. Okay, because what you're going to have to have is at least 150,000 people transplanted out of here as a result of that. That's connected to this. You see, because this isn't just COVID. This is not just a COVID issue. It is. It was an acceleration and an exacerbation of the gentrification that was already in process. It was already in process. All it did was accelerate. And so I would like things centered on that as well because it seems like COVID absorbed those ethical and moral and redlined issues that we still haven't confronted, that we need to confront. And I, I, I would like that larger conversation. Uh, the person with the phone number 5140. Where is all this money gonna come from? I mean, the amount of money that this city spends is unbelievable. I mean, I know people need help, but I mean, rents here are huge. Where is all this millions and millions of dollars going to come from? It's going to fall from the sky? Guys, are, I mean, meanwhile, you drive around in your Priuses looking for flagpoles and sheds. Next is going to be SJPD looking for gun revenue. Where's it all going to come from? How are you going to pay for everybody's rent? I'd like the city council to answer that. And you're going to have the administrative costs and all this administration to hand out these. I mean, it's terrible what happened. And you guys caused it by closing these built businesses down and having all these regulations, especially the county. What a bunch of dirtbags they are that you, that you guys count out to. It's unbelievable. All right, returning to the council. Questions or motion? Move, Move approval. approval. I'll second <laughs> Council right, Member I'll, Foley's motion. I'll give, I'll give the motion to Council Member Foley. Second to Council Member Sparza. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. I just want to thank uh, our, our city team and all of our nonprofit partners, City Heart, and everybody for their really effective uh, distribution of these funds very rapidly to families in need. Really appreciate that. 
And thanks also to Destination Home for their efforts to get this rolling. Okay. Uh, let's go on to item 8.3. That is amendment to the existing home investment partnerships program agreement with Sacred Heart Community Services to continue administering COVID-19 related tenant based rental assistance program. There is no presentation, I believe. So we'll go to public comment. Tessa. Thank you. Well, about homes, you know, I, I know it's like saying it's about rental assistance, but it's also about the fact that the city is not building enough housing and that the priorities have been about uh, commercial development. And that's where the big change, even I found out that when you look at the, um, the what's happening at Berryessa, that actually the 2007 plan was to have more residential and then the whole city about getting commercial development and no, no jobs for housing conversion. And that's where, you know, it left our community with the property in our historic neighborhood that we can't build any residential because of your wanting this, I call it the financializing of our lands. And, you know, you're not looking at the real crisis that we have about housing. And you even, you know, even when there was an affordable housing on the block, you created an ordinance to stop the affordable housing. So you're really not dealing with our housing crisis. Uh, Blair? Hi, thank you. Really nice words from Tessa. Um, I first want to thank Sacred Heart for uh, these past two items and all the incredible work that they do. And uh, boy, just a reminder, I mean, we're entering a new era of how to talk about subsidies. And I don't want you guys to close it off and to make it uh, you know, really difficult with using a Victorian language of propriety when we could be just sharing good caring practices with each other. Please don't go into that trap, you know, that we have to practice some Victorian capitalism model and we can't say the word subsidy to each other. It's good stuff. It's helpful. It's caring. Um, how do we talk about the future of ELI, VLI, and mixed income? Those are ideas that are planned for 2025 and beyond. Can we please start talking about those ideas now and really working on them now? Thank you. Uh, person with the phone number ending 5140. We're nearing the end of the month of the Sacred Heart. Uh, there wasn't anything at City Hall about that, though, but it's amazing how City Hall uses Sacred Heart. Not only do they use them uh, for various charity work, uh, but uh, they, they use them for votes, and it's terrible that a Catholic organization is doing business with people like you and you know that you won't even say the words christmas or easter and then, but you'll say sacred heart because they get your votes and they do work for you so you'll use those words so i find it really interesting how convenient a catholic organization can become for a crooked city council that you all are and you are you guys know it you you, you know what you do you just want to suck money and free labor out of people and try to think that you're going to give houses away. You're not going to do anything. You're going to give houses to your friends. You're going to give subsidies to your Thank you. Paul Soto? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I want to publicly uh, thank Sacred Heart for what it is that they do. Boncho, I, I, Boncho, I've seen and heard on a few panels on different meetings, and I really... He, he's very, very knowledgeable and sophisticated in the way that he uses language to center uh, process so that it facilitates uh, situations. He, he, is, he is a master at that. I can't wait to talk to him with. I need to have a conversation with him. But what, what I keep asking for from this council is for a, long, a longer term plan. Because it, it, it's a, there, there's, there's moral issues involved here, not just issues of law. They are moral and ethical issues, not just towards the person, but to ourselves. We do something to ourselves when we don't allow ourselves to be sensitive. All right, let's go back to council. Move approval. Second. Motion, Councilmember Sparza. Second, Councilmember Foley. Let's vote. Ennis? Yes. Morales? Yes. Owen? 
Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Ahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Mercado? Aye. Thank you. All right, we're on to 8.4, Community Priorities for the Alum Rock Corridor Report. There is a presentation. I see Jared Hart is here. Jared, will you be guiding us through this? I will. So let's see, let's share my screen here. All right. Great, so uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and, and City Council, Jared Hart, Division Manager with Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. Um, so uh, staff is uh, bringing forward today a report uh, titled Community Priorities for the Alum Rock Corridor to be considered for acceptance by the City Council uh, to establish a formal community identified priorities list to serve as guidance for city staff the community developers and decision makers for the Alum Rock corridor area between Highway 101 and 680, particularly uh, in the Alum Rock urban village. Um, the report was prepared by graduate students uh, at San Jose State University in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, <clears throat> excuse me, using a three phase engagement and assessment process. Um, that was in partnership uh, with Council Member uh, Carrasco's office and Com University and was also uh, partially funded uh, by a grant from the city's housing department. Uh, the locational area that the report covers includes the Alum Rock and Little Portugal urban village areas as shown on the slide. Um, so the graduate students uh, created two reports as part of their multi-semester work between 2019 and uh, 2020. The first report entitled uh, Vision for the Alum Rock Quarter assessed the focus area social, physical and uh, cultural characteristics through neighborhood walking tours and informal conversations with residents and businesses. Um, the second report entitled Community Priorities for the Alamo Corridor uh, built upon the assessment report and established a list of community identified priorities and strategies uh, with an emphasis on land use, transportation and cultural infrastructure and assets. Uh, this second report is what staff have brought before council to consider for acceptance today uh, per direction from the Rules Committee. Um, so the, the community priorities list in the report is reflected on this slide and, and includes um, prevention of resident and uh, business displacement, um, access to affordable housing, improvements to transportation infrastructure and park facilities, uh, including youth and teen programming, access to grocery stores and farmers markets, and support for culturally relevant public art. Uh, many of the identified priorities in the report have existing implementation mechanisms through current city regulations and programs, uh, which are detailed in table one of staff's memo. Um, the community priorities report states uh, that it aims to inform the existing Alum Rock Urban Village Plan, uh, develop community priorities for future improvements and investments, and act as an advocacy tool uh, to guide future developments. Um, if the City Council accepts uh, the community priorities for the Alamo Quarter Report, the report will provide non-binding informational context and guidance to city planners, uh, the, the community developers and decision makers on the community's priorities for the section of the Alamo Quarter between Highway 101 and 680, uh, but more specifically, the Alamo Rock Urban Village is shown on the map on the slide. Um, because the report is informational in nature, uh, it cannot serve as a council policy document with which proposed development projects would be required to conform. However, um, the report will provide guidance and will supplement the existing Alum Rock Urban Village Plan, also known as the Pedestrian Oriented Zoning Districts. Um, lastly, staff would like to thank and uh, commend the San Jose State University students and the community members for their work on the priorities report. Uh, there are many community community members who participated in this effort uh, with the students who, who are also planning to speak today, uh, but unfortunately we're not able to uh, stay around for public comment. And with that, that uh, concludes uh, staff's presentation. And thank you, Jared. And thanks for your work with the community and thanks to uh, the uh, 
the good, bright minds and passionate hearts of San Jose State University to help us uh, uh, work to create this, this important document. Uh, Tessa Woodman's here. Go. Hi, yes. The sixth intergovernmental panel on climate change report steads. But simply swapping a gas guzzler for a Tesla or planting billions of trees to offset business as usual isn't going to cut it, the report warns. We need transformational change operating on processes and processes and behaviors at all levels, individual, community, business, institutions, and governments. It says we must re redefine our way of life. So that's the... Um, uh, the type of transformational change that we need. And it does in involve, the transformational change really involves us getting back to basics, which is food, clothing, and shelter. And we really have to put into our planning to grow food locally. That is essential as we have to go to zero in, if, if we're going to survive as a species. And so that, that needs to really change. Thank you, Blair. Hi, thank you for those words from Tessa. I'm really interested how uh, Councilperson Carrasco, uh, how her initial ideas for redevelopment of the uh, of District 5 and Alamark area when she first took office, how she's kind of grown and matured her ideas since that time. And I think I'm gonna be pretty impressed with what she's doing with this, uh, these things. Uh, thank you very much for it. Uh, the plaza ideas for an urban village uh, seem really interesting. And I think, uh, I think they're trying to work to reflect what was the initial ideas of Vision Zero in Guadalajara, Mexico, which was more of a uh, whole community experience, uh, you know, uh, of, of a marketplace and, and sharing and celebration. And uh, it wasn't just surveillance technology and public neighborhood safety. So good luck with... Uh, these issues and how this can talk to the flea market about uh, good. Uh, Paul Sutter. Uh, yes, um, I say it all the time because I'm very proud of this, it, uh, this legacy that I that I bear, and that is that I'm a descendant of that area. That is a crime scene. That is a crime scene. There was crimes against humanity committed there. I don't speak Spanish today as a result of that. I'm looking at a picture right now of my father and two tias inside of the tent, 1943. They arrived there in 1938. And they weren't immigrants. They are American citizens, always have been. Been here in California since 1821. And what I'm asking is that there be a certain degree of reverence and sensitivity to what is going on in that area. You see, if you don't center and make sensitize the people to that to those crimes against humanity if you don't sensitize them to that then they have no recollection or no understanding and uh Alma Redondo. Uh, good evening um my name is alma redondo i'm a co-chair of aruga which is alam rock urban village advocates and i want to thank council member carrasco the housing department and Com University for this work. And I hope the council accepts this document. Um, I support the acceptance of this um, addition to the community as community input to the existing document. That document is very scant. It only has like five page, five half pages. And we're really looking forward to having community input into the urban village plan. So I'm really grateful for, for this work as a resident of Olam Rock. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Imelda, welcome. Hi, uh, my name is Imelda Rodriguez. I am the community director for Community And my quick ask is, please accept the community priorities for the Olam Rock corridor report. Um, I want to use this time to thank the community of District 5, those in the neighborhoods surrounding the Alamora Corridor, uh, especially key uh, leaders who spend time with the SJSU urban planning students and Somos Mayfair and the School of Arts and Culture. I just can't thank you enough for your generosity. And thank you to Aruba, Alamora Urban Village Advocates for being um, bringing together 
leaders from different community groups and Aruba will continue to keep the torch lit to ensure that responsible and equitable development takes place on the corridor. And of course, thank you to council member Carrasco and staff for supporting our work and your community and for staying engaged throughout the duration of the project. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your leadership with King University and other, and thanks for all the work you guys do in our city. Uh, person 5140. And if you're going to build all these villages, there's there going to be enough uh, electricity, water, all these new corridors, roads. I don't know. I don't think you guys are. I don't think you guys are realizing what it takes to run a city. You guys basically have a student union going on there. Like I said, with a with with a with a uh, term paper, you should title Fantasyland. Uh, all this gentrification, man, it sure backfired when, the, when those poor people at the flea market were going to have everything taken away from them. You guys backpedaled a little bit. You guys had no idea, or actually you did. You just wanted to edge them out so you could have CVS and uh, Safeway there. Oh, that's going to be interesting. Yeah, next, next thing you're going to see is a Jamba Juice. Yeah, it'd be real good uh, what, how you guys do these villages. Not. Yeah, you guys really need to, to do better planning and have. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> um, hi, I'm sorry. My name is Brenda Sendejas. I'm from District 5, and I'm here calling to support Mascarenas Carrasco Memo. Um, as a resident on Alum Rock, I want to say that um, I want to thank organizations that ensure that there is community input and that things are going um, smoothly. Uh, I do say with Aruva, on Saturdays, and they do a lot of this work to ensure that, you know, they protect our community. So I just want to give them a shout out and also Matgalana Carrasco for working together with the community and ensuring that she has the best interest for Alan Rock. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, and speaking of Council Member Carrasco, uh, thank you for your work with the community to make this happen. Council Member? Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> and, and my apologies, I'm having some difficulties with, uh, I can't open up the document on my other uh, electronics. They're fixing the, of all, of all things, they're fixing the uh, bandwidth in my neighborhood. And so I've, I've been struggling all week. So I may have to ask staff to put it up in, in the event that I need help. But uh, I, I wanted to just um, briefly uh, or, or very quickly thank many people that have been involved over the past couple of years, uh, primarily, well, first of all, the community who has been very engaged. And I wanted to thank Come University uh, and our San Jose State students. You know, uh, they came in as students and I'm hoping that they left as, uh, as very engaged residents of the city of San Jose, truly understanding the importance of this kind of work, uh, which is to preserve the culture and the richness of a community that is right at the brink of, of uh, gentrification and displacement uh, at a time when, at a, at a very pivotal time. Who would have known that in the middle of this work, we were going to be dealing with, uh, with uh, the biggest uh, public health crisis of our time, a pandemic, uh, COVID-19, uh, I said it kicked our butts and, and posed so many challenges. But I think that this also speaks to the work that they were already doing and now the work that still needs to be done. The, the report that was produced uh, is very extensive and, and it's, uh, it's uh, in my opinion, worth the read. Uh, and uh, I'm going to make a motion to have it accepted uh, for many, many reasons. One is that Alam Rock, uh, I have the great honor of representing Alam Rock and uh, its neighboring um, uh, neighborhoods and, and the residents, but truly it's a gem. And the documents that I presented during the budget process was really an attempt to highlight and to raise the platform of an area that, um, that has had a narrative written for us. Um, and sometimes it hasn't been a very glorified narrative. It's been a narrative that has uh, been 
uh, rather negative, and we seem to get the attention only when uh, when somehow it's uh, salacious headlines. But there's so many beautiful and wonderful historical facts that are part of the East Side, and the residents and our families, our children, and the future of the East Side deserve so much better. And I, and I think that in reading this report, we really get a flavor for what is the East Side. Uh, I want to thank uh, um, Ms. Arredondo for speaking up. Brenda always speaks up. And of course, Imelda, who just took the mic a second ago, uh, they, they are uh, true advocates. Uh, they speak from the heart, but they, they are exemplary um, and, and symbolic of what is the east side of San Jose. They love the east side of San Jose, just as my children do and just as I do. And I hope that those who read this report will come to understand and, and, uh, and, um, and get to love not just what is the east side, but the promise of the east side. Um, with that, I'm going to make a motion to accept the report and really also hope that as we continue to move on policies, we continue to reaffirm our commitment to move policies with a lens for equity, because this is really what the report is about. Thank you. I'll second that. Second. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Council Member. All right, uh, let's vote on Council Member Carrasco's motion. Yes. Yes. Morales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Osco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Oli? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're on to the land use consent calendar. That's uh, 10 point. One, and I believe that's A and B. I move to accept the land use consent calendar. Second. Okay. Um, I would like to uh, reserve a no vote on 10.1B. Can I do that just on a straightforward vote, Mr. Norris? Voting no on one and yes on the other. Mayor, are you are you pulling it? I'm sorry, I um, yeah. I, I guess I guess I have to pull it. Yeah, yeah. I guess I would have to pull it just so I could vote no. So, uh, Councilman Cohn, could I could I yeah, move you? item ten point one a then? Okay. All right. Great. Uh, on just ten point one a, uh, is there any comment, uh, Mr. Soto? We're discussing the rezoning at five thousand Mitty Way. Uh, yes, and that's a Jesuit school in Bellarmine, Harvard, Georgetown. I guess that would make you a Jesuit too. And Peter Burnett is buried in a Jesuit cemetery, in Mission Cemetery. And there's a reason for that, is that Peter Burnett sided with the Catholic Church in 1851 to establish Santa Clara University. That's why he's buried in their cemetery. So those land, all these land changes and all these land that's accumulated by the Catholic Church, by the Jesuits specifically, is tainted with the policy that they sided with in instituting uh, uh, the decapitations that happened as a result of Peter Burnett's uh, policy. You can't separate the Jesuit order, Archbishop Midi, Presentation High School, St. Leo's, or Sacred Heart, or Santa Clara University. Tessa? Yes, I'm just going to read it again because the word processes is very important. It means the actions or steps taken in order to achieve a particular end. And that's what we're talking about. Our general plan and our land use is very critical. And when the sixth intergovernmental panel on climate change report states, 
that simply swapping a gas guzzler for a Tesla or planting billions of trees to offset business as usual so we're talking isn't about going to, I know. Well, what we're talking, I understand. We're talking percent. about we're talking about a general plan, and that's the processes. Our processes, as the six gener the IPCC report says, have to be transformational change. We need transformational change in yeah, our so processes. We're, we're talking about uh, the item ten point one a. Uh, Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here to try to address uh, the zoning issues of the consent calendar, if that's possible at this time. Um, you know, I, I mentioned a few times, uh, I try to make it uh, regular. The idea is uh, you having uh, issues of single income, uh, single, single use family uh, housing, uh, how that can relate to mixed income ideas uh, in future zoning issues. I hope it can help in some way. I don't know where and how yet, but uh, I feel it's a good starting point for creative dialogue and conversation. And just a simple thank you uh, again for the Alamark project and how it's uh, good practices of history, I think can very much help the future of the San Jose flea market uh, development. Thank you. Okay, on 10.1a, which is conforming rezoning on 5,000 Midi Way, uh, Councilor Crossley, do you wanna speak on this item or the next one? I see your hands up. Pretty yeah, sure she means the next one. Yeah, I suspect so. But I know she's got a bad connection. Uh, okay, why don't we vote on 10.1A? That's when across the can recall it if I'm wrong, I'm but I'm pretty sure Hi. she's... Oh. Sorry about that. I was uh, raising my hand for 10.1B, uh, for B. B, not, yeah. not 1A, sorry. Okay, great. All right, let's vote on 10.1A. Menace. Yes. Morales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, 10.1B. Uh, Councilor Carrasco? I thank you, Mayor. And uh, this is uh, this is uh, coming back to us from last week, and I'm hoping that um, we can have a conversation with the applicant, uh, our new director, Chris, or with Robert, uh, because this, uh, as I had expressed uh, a week ago, is uh, is situated in a very problematic corner of the east side of San Jose. So. Um, you know, I, I expressed it last week. I don't want to penalize a good business uh, due to bad actors, but let's let's uh, talk about what's happening on this corner. So, uh, across the street from this corner is a uh, a business that is uh, that that has some some difficulties in maintaining uh, uh, just just behaving well and attracting uh, uh, good folks. And again, it's not a reflection on uh, the businesses that, uh, that are around the city and especially not in, the, in District 5. But I do have some issues regarding the application as it stands. So um, uh, Director Burton, can we talk about the, the current application as it's being presented today? Uh, yeah, council member, happy to sort of give you the brief overview uh, of the application as it stands. Um, the application was received uh, originally back in 2018. Um, it did sit on a hold uh, through the pandemic, but the applicant uh, sort of reactivated or re-engaged with staff earlier this year. Um, it's ultimately for uh, a number of different components, uh, including a rezoning of the site to conform with the general plan. Uh, a site development permit for uh, the redevelopment of the site and the construction of the convenience store, um, a conditional use permit for off-sale of alcohol, which includes the requirement for uh, 
council to uh, make a determination of public convenience and necessity, um, as well as uh, a, a requirement for the conditional use permit for uh, late night use, so extended hours. Now, uh, the existing site did allow or did have um, later hours, but that uh, predated the requirement. Uh, and so in sort of bringing forward this CUP, we're analyzing those hours uh, separately as a, uh, essentially as a new use. Thank you. So, so the so I, I want to talk about a couple of things uh, uh, regarding the the application, uh, and, and one is um, the the hours of operation uh, that are being presented. And the hours of operation that are being presented is from five a.m. to eleven p.m. And I know that the I, I thought the applicant was here. Can somebody help me locate the applicant? I don't know if it's Armando. Or yeah, Henry, yeah, Armando Gomez. Yeah, I is think he found I Armando Tom Gomez or Armando. Uh, Tom, Robinson, yes. Tom Robinson, yes, Tom Robinson, yeah. So, uh, so uh, the the hours of operation for the convenience store and the gas station is from five a.m. to eleven p.m. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, and the the um, the beer and wine that's being proposed for sale is uh, would not be sold from five to eleven, from my understanding, because that's not that's not even legal. That's correct, as I understand it. Yes. Yes. So it's being proposed to be sold uh, from. I just want to get the facts first before we, we get into this conversation. It's it's being proposed to be sold from 6 a.m. Let me just I'm just uh, I just want to confirm that with staff just to make sure I have the absolute right hours. Um, Robert or Alec, can you confirm on the off sale the hours, please? This is right. Robert Manfro, Deputy Director for uh, Planning. The, the hours are 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. from Monday to Friday, 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Saturdays, and 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. on Sundays. But, so they but that, vary but that's, from but the weekday the to the weekend. Uh, Robert, but are, that's not the sale of the, of the beer and, and wine, is it? John Chu, San Jose uh, Planning Supervising Planner. So just to clarify, there's two different actions on here. One is for the off-sell all call and one is for the operation of the business. So any businesses that want to open before 6 a.m. or at 12 p.m. have to get an all have to get a uh, John, I think you got a bad connection. So our permitting and the restriction video. are gonna have to still be governed by state laws. Sure. So to clarify, there are two different conditional use permits uh, that are incorporated. One is for late night use, one is for the off-sale of alcohol. So any businesses that are asking to operate after midnight or before 6 a.m. have to get an, um, a 24-hour late night use. So that's one component. The actual hours of the operation of the sale of alcohol will still be governed by the state as part of their license by ABC. So they, the state doesn't allow you to sell it before uh, 6 a.m., then that would be the governing laws for their hours of the off-sale. Right, so my question is, when is the proposed sale of beer and wine according to this application? I believe the earliest you can start is 6 a.m., but I would I would have to double check that. That's going to be by the state. Okay, so uh, so if uh, Armando or or uh, who's here or Tom. I, I, I'm here, but are we going to start in the middle, or how are we doing this? Well, I have a question. I'd like to know when when you're proposing to sell uh, uh, beer and, and wine. You are not you are not allowed to sell alcohol from two a.m. to six a.m. We are open at five a.m. So from five to six, we would not be able to sell alcohol. We are not staying open twenty four hours nor are we staying open till 2 a.m. So we would we would sell alcohol until we closed at 11 p.m. When would you propose to start selling? 
at 6 a.m. It'd be 6 a.m. to uh, 11 a.m. 11 p.m. 11 p.m. Okay, that was the question. So beer and wine would start to sell at 6 a.m. to p uh, 11 p.m. Correct. Okay, so that was the question. Thank you. Uh, okay, and um, okay, so I, I've got, I've, okay, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, and would you, would you reconsider uh, starting at a later time? Because uh, I, I don't, I don't see why 6 a.m. Uh, is the start time. Would you reconsider starting at 9 a.m.? Well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm on um, council member. I'm unclear what, what we're doing here. Are, are, are we going to go one issue at a time? I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm trying to, first off, it, it, so, I, so it doesn't, me, okay, so let me, let me, okay, so, so allow me, allow me uh, to, to, uh, to be a little clear. I'm having, I'm struggling with this corner. And I'm struggling with the corner because this corner is one of the corners that has a, a great number of uh, vehicular um, uh, fatalities, crashes, and just across the street from uh, Rotten Robbie is uh, a liquor store that has had 50 incidents just within the last three years, between 2018 and 2021. Anywhere from assault and battery, uh, drugs, uh, auto theft, uh, breaking and entering, uh, you name it, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it runs the gamut. And so, and then there's three, there's three sites within a thousand feet that have uh, liquor accessibility. Rotten Robbie doesn't sell liquor, they'll be selling beer and wine. But Rotten Robbie would be the fourth. And so according to the criteria that ABC has, it currently doesn't have a, a so-called over-concentration. But given all these other issues, I'm trying to get you to help me make a case to my council colleagues as to why they should vote yes. 6 a.m. doesn't seem like a reasonable time to sell beer and wine. But you sell very little of it. Believe me, you sell very little beer at 6 a.m. Then, then, then you would agree that 9 a.m. would be a logical. Here's, here, here's my my understanding: is this project, this project is way bigger than a focus on when we start selling beer. My understanding was that the plan, because the planning staff has done a great job, they put out a very positive report. It was my understanding that they would partly sell this project to you and your council colleagues. And then I would get a chance after that to be able to add to that. And at that point, if somebody was hung up on something, then we would come back to that. Now, I, I don't know if that's, if you don't want to do it that way, that's, I guess, okay, but it just seems like we're, we're taking, we're taking a minor thing when we're looking, this is a big project that's going to be wonderful for that corner, you know, if we can have a conversation about it and not get hung up on whether we sell beer at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. or whatever. So I'm confused. Mr. Yes, Robinson, let me help can you, can you a little bit. I Can think you your see best me? path forward is to just answer the questions that are posed by Councilmember Carrasco because it's pretty late at night and we're not going to go through a real long dog and pony show. I think just responding to the questions would be most constructive. I apologize. Go for the, go for the question. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. So uh, um, I, 
I, I, like I said, it's a, it's a problematic corner. It's a problematic census track actually. And so I, I'm trying to, uh, I, I welcome uh, uh, Rotten Robbie into the district because it, it is a beautiful site and I, you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to support this business. I'm trying to land in the middle here so that we can have a beautiful corner to be supportive of your business, but also to make sure that I provide uh, a healthy business for my district. So uh, uh, I, I have issue with, uh, with uh, liquor being sold at six in the morning. I don't understand why it's being sold that early. So that's just one issue. The other is um, uh, items that are sold in uh, singular form or, you know, the, the 40s or the, I, I don't know what they call it, but would you be willing also to sell in six packs and above? I, I believe so. Is, are there more things that, that you have on your list? Uh, I do, sir. Okay. So is this something that would be uh, would be acceptable to you? Well, okay. So I've been sir, chastised by sir, the can mayor. I, can I? Can we just please? Well, I'm trying to answer the question. I let, let me. Okay, I'm sorry that I have to ask a question of the question, but going back to your first one. Are you talking about starting later? Are you are you also starting? Are you also talking about quitting sales before um, before we close, three hours before you can legally sell? Three hours before you can legally. Well, we're, we're, we're closing at eleven o'clock. We're closing at eleven o'clock. We're closing at eleven o'clock. If we can, you can legally sell up to two o'clock. So we're not, we're already, we're already limiting our hours by closing at 11 o'clock, which is, which is significant. You know, I, I sort of kiddingly said that, that you don't sell much in the morning. You really don't sell much in the morning. Although, you know, everybody that sells alcohol, whether it's the liquor store, if they're open or Safeway or anybody or any of the places that are 24 hours, basically start selling at 6 a.m. That's just, just the way it is. It's, it's not that there's much sales. If you have a problematic period, typically it's late at night and it's closer to when the bars are gonna close and, and we're not open at those hours. And so I'm just, you know, I guess what I would say is if you want us to not start selling beer at eight o'clock, that's probably fine. Nine seems to me to be very late because people come by and they, they it's not that they're necessarily drinking it, I mean, in general, that's the case. They're, they're buying it. They're buying it for either their lunch or they're buying it for later. And, and it just gets to be confusing. Um, and so, and, and so I, 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 people aren't at 6 a.m. starting to get drunk, put it that way. Well, uh, you know, this corner, and, and maybe you're unaware of it because you're, <laughs> you're, you don't have a convenience store there yet. Uh, but this is a corner where we have a lot of we have a lot of diversity, but we also have a lot of issues with folks who uh, who have difficulties with uh, with alcohol, who uh, you will soon find uh, will start to drift in to your store probably very early in the day. Uh, I know this because this is where I live. And I have issues uh, at Jack's Liquor I have issues on the corner of Story and Camera. I have issues at the Stop and Go. Um, we drive by there and we see them. They loiter, they hang out there, um, they recycle their one bottle and they go and they grab another one. It is, it's not an unusual practice. I. I Council member, I am familiar. We actually do operate a location very close right around the corner that, that does still start selling beer at 6 a.m. And, and it goes until closing. And, and I don't know off the top of my head what our hours of closing are, but I know we're not 24 hours. We close at probably 11 o'clock or um, something like that. I'm not sure off the top of my head.
Now, the other question you asked me was about single sales. And, and, I, and I think that the single, single sales thing is, it's, an, it's, it's sort of an old concern. I mean, sort of back in the day, uh, like when I was a kid, you used to have the guy that was buying the cheap fortified malts and they drank them out of brown paper bags. Um, and, and so the solution was don't sell singles, but that has changed greatly because, you know, now, now our single sales, quite frankly, have gone upscale. Um, what they are is they're much more expensive craft beers and we sell a ton of craft beers and, and they, and, 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 and so what you end up having a lot of times with the craft beers is somebody doesn't want, uh, you know, they don't want six of them. They just want to get a couple of them or they want to experiment with different ones. And so they're not, they're not the brown paper bag product that they used to be. Now, would, would we accept, you know, an, um, an, um, uh, 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 not being able to sell um, singles? Um, I, I guess I would, in particular, I would if, if after a period of time and after you could see this great project and after the community saw how it worked, that we could revisit it. Um, I, I, I think that it's, I think really all single sales does is, is become anti-consumer and it makes people have to buy six expensive beers rather than one or two. And so, Again, my concern is the activity that I've seen on this corner. You know, if, if we were in another area in the city, uh, Mr. Robinson, where, where you didn't have the activity that we have going on there, I would say, go ahead and sell your IPAs and allow people to experiment and, you know, get their sours and their loggers and, uh, and have a, a variety and they can go ahead and, uh, and, and uh, experiment. But this is not, this is not uh, you know, Highland Park or, you know, uh, it's not the Rose Garden. This is, this is the east side of San Jose and this is the corner of Jackson and Story Road. This is where we've had 50 very violent incidents uh, involving weapons and drugs, assault, and theft uh, in just three years, and where we've had an overconcentration of uh, of arrests in a very small area, and, and you and, and there's no way that you can convince me that that um, that this can't be problematic. Um, Council Member Armando Gomez here, uh, Mr. Mayor. To also a uh, quick question for you. Would it be okay if maybe Tom did a, a quick presentation? I, I want to be sensitive to the council member's time or to the council's time. We'll keep it under a few the minutes. It might be the council better um, idea of what we're doing. I, I've got another council member I know has questions. I, I really think we, we, we really don't need presentations. This is on consent. I think council member Cross had specific questions. I, I, certainly, Mr. Robinson can respond to any questions by providing whatever information you want. Uh, but I'm, I'm really not, you know, we're at uh, 10 o'clock and we've got a few more items to go before we can get this, this meeting wrapped up. Uh, Councilmember Carrasco, can I go to Councilmember Sparson yes. and come back to you? Absolutely. Okay, Councilmember Sparson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, uh, I won't make a motion. I'll defer to Councilmember Carrasco since this is her district. Um, I will say I, you know, I have similar concerns to this. I um, know this neighborhood. I've gotten to hear um, about people passed out on this corner, um, passed out drunk, in addition to the crimes um, that happen on this, uh, in this area. Um, and I will say- It's a great corner. It does really well. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a very solid location. So really what, com what happens is that if you say no, what we're going to do is, you know, we've been working on this for three years. We probably haven't maintained it as well as we should. We're going to put a coat of paint on it, and we're just going to take the money that we can, and we'll redeploy it in either a different district 
or a different city. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Robinson, do you, I, I think from, re, you know, this, I didn't comb through every single line in this, do, in, the, in this item, just simply because it's not in my district, but obviously it was deferred last time. So I did, I did peruse through it and it seems like there's gonna be the, the floor space in the new development, I think is about 3,200 square feet, the floor space dedicated to alcohol, is it correct? It's gonna be about 5%? Yeah, give or take, yeah, something okay. like that. Okay, and, and the reason I ask that is, as you, you know, I'm going to vote in, in support of deferring this, because I, I I think we would all be better served, and you would be better served, if some, if those, if some of these sort of details are, are worked out before it comes, you know, before us to make a decision, so that way we're not sort of negotiating on the fly. Uh, but what I would say is, or, or the question I would ask you is, if there was a reduction in floor space as it relates to the alcohol sale, is that something, and I don't know what that would look like, or even if it's something council member um, Carrasco would be interested in, but is that something you would be interested in talking about during the course of the deferral? Probably not. One of, one of the things that, that we have done now with all of our new stores is we effectively have uh, the beer in a walk-in cooler. Okay. The great thing about it is that we're never out of stock and, and, and it reduces the labor, but it also allows you to sell not just six packs and 12 packs, but you can sell 18 packs. You can sell every, any size. Mm -hmm. And so it allows you to have a, a good selection. And so um, I think that, that I, I, I think, I think that's a solution without a purpose, put it that way. Um, and, right. and so and I, and I was just throwing that out there just, you know, uh, I'm again, I'm, I'm hoping that some of this has worked out before it comes back again. But uh, anyhow, thank you so much for coming forward. And I, like some of my other colleagues, just during the course of the conversation, felt a little frustrated and it felt a little, um, uh, just a little awkward. <laughs> and it seemed like you were reacting to that. And, and so I, I can appreciate that. And so uh, I, hopefully, you know, go ahead, sir. I, I, and I apologize too. I mean, everybody knows how late this is and, and you know, it started at 11 o'clock or, or, or whatever. And, um, and I think we've got such a great project and I, and I was quite frankly, so bummed that, that we weren't able to show you what we wanted to do. And, and, and so that, that to me was, was very frustrating. And, and it really was not my intention to come in and negotiate the project on the fly. Right. Mr. Right. Robinson, there was no question on the floor. We're, we're going to move on because we've got to get. We've got several people who want to talk, and so you certainly can respond to questions as they come. And up. so, and so, and so, I still have my ten minutes, right, Mayor? Okay, sure, okay. Councilman. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to wrap it up. I, I, okay. I have no other questions, Mr. Robinson. I'm sure we'll be hearing from you, but but next time around, I would like to see the presentation for for whatever that's worth to to get a sense as to what the project looked like and, and whatever benefits may may be emanating from the project. So, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Councilmember Sparson. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna, just gonna say a couple of things very quickly. One is I, I support the deferral and, and I supported it because I, I do think um, this doesn't need to be hashed out uh, um, on the Zoom dais, um, but it sounds like there is some more work to do. Um, and, and yes, I, I do have issues about the alcohol license at this location. And, and just to be clear, I represent a target in my district that does not sell alcohol because of the concerns in certain communities um, and they make money, they're very busy. So, um, so, so, you know, those exemptions exist, they exist for a reason. And, and I, I think that there's some more talking to do and some more negotiating and uh, with the community and input with the community. And I, and I think it sounds like um, the council member and, um, and the business should sit down with the community and, uh, and I look forward to seeing this come back to us um, after the concerns have been addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. As far as I might just add, I routinely go to gas stations that don't sell alcohol because uh, there was actually a time in the late 90s and early 2000s when the city prohibited the sale of alcohol at gas stations. Uh, council member Arenas. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to interject to um, default back to uh, Council Member Carrasco. This is her district, and I think the conversation's um, gone sideways here. Um, and so I, I would actually like to ask Council Member Carrasco uh, what she would like to do in her district, as she knows 
her district the best. Um, Councilmember Carrasco, is is a deferral something that you're interested in? Uh, thank, thank you, Councilmember, and, and I and I appreciate everybody's input. Uh, you know, uh, I've often said. Uh, you know, we vote uh, on here and we impact everybody. And so I appreciate um, the motion that was made. Thank you, Council Member Cohen, uh, for doing that. And I appreciate also the comment that uh, that Council Member uh, Sergio just made that uh, that there's some frustration. And I think the frustration is this. Uh, I tried to talk to the applicant earlier today so that we could hash some of these things out and there was no budging. And so it's unfortunate because if we had uh, hashed it out earlier and talked about the hours of operation and the single selling uh, uh, or the selling of the single items earlier, uh, when my staff tried to contact and have this kind of conversation out, maybe we wouldn't have been hashing it out here on the mic. There's also some other issues of concern that I called planning on. And uh, had that been hashed out, we wouldn't be doing it on uh, the mic. I don't like to uh, do those kinds of things. I tend to not do those kinds of things. I think uh, 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 a staff can attest that I'd like to do this uh, behind the scenes and not do it here uh, on the mic because I, I don't think that that's in good taste either. And so the frustration that everyone's feeling, I feel it as well. So let's defer it, let's do the work, let's try and get together and let's make sure that no one is feeling frustrated. So thanks so much. Thank you, council member. All right, then, uh, let us, well, I'm sorry, there's a hand up, uh, Tessa. Oh, oh, I just, I'm um, very, very impressed with um, our, our council member, uh, Carrasco and um, Maya Sparza for really speaking up for the neighborhood. And I think these are such valid concerns. And, and I love what um, uh, Maya Esparza said that the, the um, Target doesn't sell alcohol. And I, I just am so proud of, of both of them for really speaking up for the neighborhood and, and not selling out to businesses and business as usual and just selling and you know making money and just really talking about the community health so thank you so much to both of them. And I really hope that, you know, the changes that, I mean, those are very minor uh, concessions that um, uh, Magdalena is asking for. You know, I think that, you know, even just not selling alcohol at all would be really great. And, and I- uh, Paul Soto. Uh, yeah, I appreciate uh, Councilwoman, uh, Carrasco's uh, concerns about the barrio. Um, and I really appreciate hearing from Jimenez. I haven't heard from your homeboy in a long ass time. I have heard nothing in your method, your Socratic method of questioning. I love it. I miss it because you know how to ask the question and draw out the information. That was excellent. I kind of, I resented the fact that Ricardo, that you interrupted him that you interrupted Jimenez when he was speaking and he had the floor. And I'm sitting here as a citizen paying attention to every word because I listen to all of our news. I'm connected to every single audio in this city because I'm from Samo. And I resent the fact that you interrupted another council member. That's what I take exception to. And so I- Brenda? Hi, my name is Brenda Sendejas from District uh, 5. Good night to everyone, and thank you guys for uh, hanging on there. Um, I did want to um, thank Arimatona Carrasco for uh, speaking out for the community. Um, as a resident in this area, I do know, and I will tell you guys, that this area is very problematic. There is a lot of alcohol use, and sadly, I will let you guys know, a lot of our children get to see that. Um, these uh, men and women sometimes walk around without their pants because they're so drunk. And so I really do appreciate that she's asking some things that are reasonable for our community. And um, I appreciate that. And I don't appreciate someone coming in here and being disrespectful and frustrated. You have to come in and know your community and what she means. And she's really trying to 
explain to you the reasons for her comments. Thank you. Thank you, Brennan. Okay, let's vote now on the deferral. Jimenez? Yes. Morales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Yes. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. And Mayhan is an aye as well. Okay. Dean Anderson? Sorry. Great. All right. We're on to item 10.2, which is City Initiated Zoning Ordinance Amendment Title 20. Uh, and there will be a presentation. Great, uh, thank you, Mayor and City Council, Jared Hart, Division Manager with Planning, Building and Code Enforcement. And I'm joined today by uh, Chris Burton, Director of PVCE and Alexander Hughes uh, from the Planning Division. All right, so a, a little background. Um, in October of 2020, uh, during the Rules and Open Government Committee, uh, meeting staff was directed to align the conditional use permit process uh, for pawnbrokers uh, with that of the determination of public convenience or necessity for off sale of alcohol contained in the municipal code. Um, this, uh, uh, this direction was meant to address the concentration of pawnbrokers near sensitive uses uh, and or traditionally marginalized communities. excuse me here so um okay so our the the existing ordinance um in title uh in title six of the municipal code currently limits uh pawnbroker businesses to no more than six in the city um a pawnbroker use uh, requires a conditional use permit to operate but the conditional use permit uh, doesn't address the issue of concentration or proximity to uh, sensitive uses um you can see on this slide, it shows the location of the four existing pawn shop businesses, and there are currently two licenses uh, pending. Go back. Okay, so uh, the proposed ordinance uh, would maintain the limit of uh, no more than six pawn brokers uh, within the city and the need for a conditional use permit. permit. Uh, the ordinance uh, would also uh, add additional conditional use permit requirements for pawnbrokers by creating distance criteria from a pawnbroker to another pawnbroker business and from pawnbrokers to sensitive uses. Um, the proposed criteria would limit concentration of pawnbroker businesses in close proximity to one another and would require that the Planning Commission consider additional findings when considering a conditional use permit for a pawnbroker that meets certain location criteria. Uh, staff did some analysis on the proposed ordinance update and found that the criteria would trigger the need for these additional findings uh, in most of the city. Uh, however, there are approximately 400 parcels that would not trigger the additional findings if a pawn broker business were proposed. Um, proposed locations would be forwarded to San Jose PD for analysis so that findings can be made under the proposed ordinance uh, during the conditional use permit process. Um, because there is a maximum of uh, six pawnbroker licenses and there's approximately 400 parcels which may support a pawnbroker business um, without the need for those additional findings, the ordinance update is proposed should not significantly affect uh, existing or future pawnbroker businesses. Um, this slide just uh, uh, details the public outreach uh, that staff did, which included, you know, um, emailing and contacting uh, interested uh, groups and individuals, including those six existing uh, businesses and tentative licensees um, for pawn brokers. Um, so the Planning Commission uh, considered this item uh, at their, their June 9th meeting and recommended to not adopt uh, the proposed pawn broker ordinance update. Uh, the commission uh, expressed that they felt that the ordinance wasn't needed based on the absence of uh, pawn shop saturation businesses currently in San Jose and that and uh, questioned the link between pawn shops as a crime attractor. 
Um, further details of the Planning Commission's discussion can be found in the Planning Commission uh, transmittal memo. Uh, staff also followed up with uh, San Jose PD regarding crime reports associated with pawn uh, shops in the city. Uh, since 2014, there have been uh, three reported stolen property reports. Um, and since 2017, there's been uh, four burglaries uh, reported at, uh, at a pawn shop. Um, so that's its statistics, um, at least recently, related to uh, crime associated with, with pawn shops. And that uh, concludes staff's presentation. All right, thank you, Jared. All right, let's go to members of the public to speak on this item 10.2, which is a city-initiated zoning ordinance amendment to Title 20. Blair? All right, thank you, Blair Beekman here. It's late in the meeting. Uh, please don't take down my hand. I wanted to speak on the last item, but I guess I can speak on this item. Uh, you know, this in item was introduced with ideas of the pawn shops and uh, uh, liquor stores and even gambling places, I feel. How, uh, what are the questions of crime around those places? And it wasn't mentioned in the previous item, I don't think, but you know, we are trying to do an ac academic uh, good purposes of, of, you know, with less liquor stores in low income neighborhoods, it, it, it promotes a better quality of life. And I, I hope you can address that and that can be understood by the uh, developer in the previous item. It's an important issue to people like the mayor, who I think when he first became a council person, it was incredibly important to, to San Jose at that time. And it's, it's good ideals that I hope can be talked about more. Uh, thank you. Uh, Paul? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I would ask that there be a, a caution with the placement of these pawn shops, because a pawn shop facilitates the uh, gentrification process, meaning that when people start getting desperate for money, they go to the pawn shop. That's why he's here. That is exactly why he's here. Okay, because they know what is going to happen within the next five years. And the next five years, the amount of desperation and the amount of poverty is going to accelerate at an exponential level. You have never, ever, ever witnessed the kind of homelessness, the kind of poverty, the kind of mental illness that's going to be walking around the streets. And the mental illness is not going to be because this person is subjectively sick. He is made sick because of the environment that he was exposed to was indifferent and intolerant to the, to the poverty that he was experiencing. Thank you, Tessa. Yes, thank you. Um, do I have my timer? Do you see my timer? Do I? I can see it. You hear me? Yes, we can, Tessa. Okay, good. Well, thank you, Paul Soto. That was gorgeous. That is totally truth, what he was speaking about, the desperation, the the poverty, the homelessness, the, 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 the food insecurity, the, you know, all the issues that are coming. And that's why the, the, the climate science says that we need transformational change. And so when you're talking about a pawn shop or, or a bar, you know, I mean, or liquor stores and, and these type of um, buildings, when we need the basics that we're going to be, you know, the, the amount of um, people that are be, gonna be coming to this area, the real climate issue in our neighborhood is going to be um, climate refugees. And so the mass amount of people that are on the move that are going to be here and the mass desperation that's going to be coming, we're not prepared for. Thank you, Robert Aguirre. Hey, Robert. Uh, my hand was also taken down on the last comment. Uh, so I, I was not allowed to speak on that. Uh, uh, anyway, so I'm glad I'm being able to speak on this one. And um, I, I'm, I know that there's, there's a supposed correlation between number of pawn shops and uh, crime but in in a sense uh, antique shops are could be the same thought of the same thing uh, if somebody wants to sell something whether they consider it to be an antique or not they can go and sell it at an antique shop and, uh, and you know there's there is some difference but I think um, you know limiting the number of uh, licenses or a number of, of pawn shops, People, if they're going to get desperate, they're going to sell stuff, they're going to find a place to sell it, whether it's in the street or at a pawn shop. At least at a pawn shop, they have an opportunity to be able to sell it and then buy it back at a later time. 
Uh, and and I, I, I don't know how much desperation is going to be going on from the public. Thank you, Brenda. Hi, I just wanted to, um, again, piggyback on what a lot of the community members are saying. And I do want to ask if there has been any research because pawn, pawn shops, you know, do um, link to crime. And, you know, I do want to highlight that a lot of these places are on Story Road and Tully Road. And so I do question these two locations because where are they located and has there been studies done? Because I will say, it, and I will agree with Paul Soto that it does create um, an increase in crime and homelessness around these areas. And people do come from other areas and they will come and do um, our areas, you know, Story and Tully that are the most vulnerable ones. So I would like a lot more research done for these zoning areas. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, return to the council. Councilor Sparzi. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I had um, some questions for Nora first, um, and uh, I know we have some more to do right after this. So anyway, I'll I'll keep it quick. But um, Nora, I had a question. Um, there have been some discussions about um, including secondhand dealers in this, um, and I'm trying to see. Oh, there you are. Um, uh, in, including secondhand dealers. Now, last fall, when these discussions were held with the city attorney's office, um, it was clear that uh, second, the as opposed to just pawn shops, the secondhand dealer definition actually incorporates a lot more than than what we were looking for, um, which is not to uh, eliminate, but to regulate. Um, uh, concerns correlated to crime. And so can you um, help me understand the definition of a secondhand dealer? Um, sure, council member. And, and uh, the, under our code, um, secondhand dealers would, um, it's a broad definition. They would pick up, um, potentially use bookstores, consignment shops, um, antique stores, used clothing stores, those types of businesses. Um, and I think that was the concern in terms of tr what exactly we were trying to address. This is a, a zoning matter specifically with regard to pawn shops, which are um, uh, permitted through the police department. Thank you. And, and I, I just wanted to address that because I have heard that desire. Um, and that's the reason why this approach is, is more surgical, so to speak. And, um, and I'm, I'm not opposed. I, I have heard some uh, requests from uh, businesses that would, would like to have the city address the We Buy Gold locations. But um, can you explain why that might be a separate process from the ABC process that the pawn shops is following? Um, sure, the, the pawn shops um, already require a CUP. And so this is um, just part of uh, the zoning and planning process, if you would. Um, if, if you wanted to um, include or have, or separately bring forward um, a short what would be shorthanded we buy gold um, businesses we would um, we would have to attempt to define those and separate them out my understanding is right now they're under um, not all not necessarily all of them some of them may be under secondhand um, uh, dealers in the definition, and so we would have to um, look at separate separating that out, determining whether or not um, there's a need for um, any type of permitting, uh, special permitting, special zoning, those kinds of things, and we'd have to work with staff on that. 
Okay, thank you. Um, and I just wanted to clarify that because um, I'm, I, and I'll just say right now, I'm not opposed to um, looking at um, the we buy gold of secondhand dealers. It's just that's a different animal. Um, and this is a very simple surgical approach. Um, and so, uh, you know, before I get to the motion, I'll, I'm, I'm interested in an amendment, but I, I don't want to slow down the simple surgical approach um, to open it up. So I, I just wanted to say that um, the city already limits um, only six licenses in the city. Um, and so we, uh, in doing so, the city um, understands that pawn shops can be detrimental to a community. We're not saying they absolutely are. Um, and so four of the city's pawn shops uh, border category three census tracts under the city's current methodology used or proposed under the siting policy without any in category one census tracts. Um, and so this follows the off sale alcohol permit process, um, really looking at environmental factors that are associated with crime. Sorry, my lights just went out. Hold um, on a sec. <laughs> We're just glad you're still alive. Okay. I know. I know. Um, sorry. Um, and so, uh, with crime um, associated with crime and social distress, and that these are disproportionately dis, um, located in communities of color. And and I'll say so. Similar to payday lending or to liquor stores, locating or having a proliferation in low-income communities is not optimal, as we just heard for strong and vibrant communities. And so this proposal would just update the existing ordinance to match an existing process set in the city's off sale alcohol beverage um, ordinance. And so again, this is not, um, this would not impact existing pawnbrokers or add any additional steps for pawnbrokers to move or apply for a new conditional use permit and I also wanted to be clear that this is not setting hard requirements or limitations as to where they can locate, but requiring that we as a city um, look at the impacts of a community prior to approving the conditional use permit. And so this ordinance is the opportunity to prevent future issues by implementing common sense criteria for evaluation under the CUP for Palm Brokers. And so with that, um, I'll make a motion um, to uh, to propose the uh, the ordinance. Second. Motion for Councilmember Spars. A second from Vice Mayor Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor. I I agree with the Planning Commission's um, recommendation that this is a solution in search of a problem. There are only two possible additional licenses for pawn shops. So I'm not going to be supporting the motion. Um, Councillor Davis, you said there are only two additional licenses. Could you explain more what you mean by that? I'm not clear. There's this limit of six, is that right? There's a limit of six and there are there are four existing pawn shops. And this- I thought the map showed six in four locations. Am I wrong? I could- I believe there are four and there were two additional. If I If I understood the- if I understood the- uh, I might have misread the map. Right? I just trying to understand. That, uh, that's correct. Uh, there's uh, four existing pawn shop businesses and then two uh, currently have pending licenses. Okay. All right. So there's four locations. I got it. Thank you. So I actually know one of the owners of, I think I do, of one of those licenses in one of the shops, Story. Um, she was actually relocated out of downtown because her building got bought. <laughs> uh, she's been, I think, a great member of the business community for many years, Jan Snyder's her name. And, and uh, so I, I'm a bit torn on this. I agree with the, you know, I, I understand the research shows there's clearly an association between pawn shops and community distress. And I'm very sensitive as I was with also alcohol to these um, built-in um, 
these these uh, elements of our built community which affect uh, and detrimentally affect communities. But I think the association is is not necessarily mean to me doesn't necessarily mean it's criminogenic. And by that I mean I, I appreciate I, th I think there was a study in Chicago that was mentioned and so forth. In California, I know that these businesses are very heavily regulated, uh, particularly to uh, to address concerns about fencing. And maybe Lieutenant, maybe Lieutenant, I'm not sure if you're involved in the routine enforcement here uh, in any way, but could you just tell us a little bit about the regulations that are in place that at least address concerns around stolen property and fencing? Uh, the major update that occurred uh, in 2016 is the state created an online program that secondhand dealers and pawn shops both have to uh, enter in anything that they buy within uh, the end of the business day or, or within the next uh, business day. And by putting in uh, descriptions of the items that they bought and the serial numbers, and uh, I believe that gets connected in with the state system of stolen items and will flag uh, both our uh, burglary unit, financial crimes unit, and uh, our permits unit. Okay, thank you. And the reason why I raise that, I mean, that's obviously well beyond, I'm guessing, what we have for any other retailer in this city. And I, I certainly appreciate why there's an association uh, between community distress and locations of pawn shops, uh, and why there would be in certain zip codes and not in others, because obviously they primarily serve residents who lack access to traditional lending. Uh, and we all know, I think, how pawn shops work, which is you put up collateral, uh, you get a loan, you don't pay the loan back, you lose the collateral. I, I feel like it's distinct, though, from payday lending because there's not the same exploitation of residents because you don't have people getting buried deeper and deeper in debt. Uh, there's a straightforward transaction. And if you put the watch forward and you don't pay the money back that you got in the loan, you lost the watch, but you don't keep burying yourself in more debt. And so, and so I guess I'm torn here a little bit because we do have this cap on the number of pawn shops. I can understand why there is value in having, there could be value to the consumer in having more than one pawn shop in one place because if you're trying to get a good deal, you probably want to go walk into multiple pawn shops and that competition would probably be a good thing for consumers and not a bad thing. And so I, I guess I, I think you heard all my concerns, Councilmember Sparza. I'm certain that the research is there that shows, as you pointed to, a connection and a correlation. I just want to understand better why concentration is particularly harmful, particularly given the fact that we really don't have many pine shops. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. And um, I, I will actually, so we did do some research, um, but I'll actually defer to Lieutenant Kidwell to talk about the connection because I, I asked PD as well as the community. So um, Lieutenant Kidwell, if you want to talk about crime and pawn shops. So I talked to our crime analysis unit and uh, they were unable to, you know, draw that direct tie between a, a pawn shop and crime. And one distinction for people to understand the difference between a pawn shop and a secondhand dealer is simply that the pawn shop can issue loans out uh, and get repaid, whereas a secondhand dealer buys and sells uh, an item. And so, uh, in that regard, you know, a person trying to sell an item can go to either you know type of location and and try to sell it to gain money. But uh, you know, a direct analysis. Uh, isn't necessary, necessarily there to say, you know, it does increase crime, but it does, uh, is an avenue uh, for someone to sell stolen property uh, among other items like the internet and, and other locations. Thank you. And Mayor, I'll just add, I, I um, talked to the vice unit um, and, uh, and some folks in robbery and they described investigations where they um, were watching folks rob a home and then would follow them because it was an investigation and and go straight to a pawn shop <laughs> um and so that's what was described to me um and um and i'll add that um i i know people that use pawn shops and just like i know people that use payday lending 
Um, I had to do, use a payday lender myself as a young person. And I know what that's like to, to be in a hole. And, and the thing with pawn shops is I know folks that have made payments for years. Um, so there's the crime correlation, but there's also victimizing low-income communities. You can make payments for years on a pawn shop item because you're just paying the interest. You, you can make payments and never make a payment on the principal. Um, and so between that and then, um, you know, hearing from police describe robberies that occur in neighborhoods and then um, hearing from police where people doing the robbing will go straight to a pawn shop um, and hearing uh, stories, because I did talk to the officers that have done some of those investigations and there are reputable pawn shops. There are absolutely reputable businesses. Um, but some of the things that were described to me, for example, were um, uh, uh, one case where um, the, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? The Chromebooks were stolen from a school and still had the stickers on them. Um, and, you know, as we all know, reputable pawn shops have to ask um, and, uh, and, and they had taken it in that investigation and just never asked and just logged it, took the sticker off and, um, and accepted it. And so, so, you know, that's why this proliferation concept, um, is introduced, you know, again, I'm not out to, to hurt a responsible business, but it's, it's a common sense test that this is affecting, you know, specifically low income neighborhoods. And we need to do better, right? That's part of the equity argument where we need to offer better options, better options for financial support than having to go to a pawn shop or a payday lender. And payday lending is unfashionable now, but I'll tell you, because I worked for the United Way at the time when the Law Foundation was leading the effort on payday lending, um, they would just make donations and, and, and people would accept a donation and then just turn around and say, oh, we, we love payday lenders, right? Because they, they fulfill a service in a neighborhood. And then after you know, a lot of work yeah. happens in communities, we see how detrimental those effects were. Yeah, oh, no, I, I see Chief Mata. I see Chief Mata on the call. Maybe he'd like to address crime. Chief Mata, I think you're- Yes, oh, there you go. I, got, I got it, thank you, Mayor. And uh, thank you, Council Member. And uh, just uh, as you mentioned, yes, um, a crime analysis cannot find that link. However, it is found in investigations. Uh, an example as um, uh, that I can speak of when I was a captain in the Foothill Division, there was a string of uh, nighttime burglaries and also not, uh, daytime burglaries that plagued uh, the Foothill Division. Uh, and the investigation led to um, that property, uh, you know, all kinds of property being uh, turned over to pawn shops here locally and also uh, out of the city. Uh, and one of the uh, cases that um, uh, the council member Sparso mentioned is uh, two years ago when we had the rash of uh, car break-ins where uh, computers and laptops were taken. Um, the investigation led to pawn shops outside of the city. So. Uh, maybe because uh, they knew that uh, we were investigating uh, some of the property here locally. But uh, yes, the statistics won't show, uh, you know, other than, you know, their break-ins or, or thefts uh, outside or on the property. But investigations do reveal, uh, investigations I've been a part of, uh, where um, individuals that uh, steal these items uh, dump off the, um, those stolen items. Thank you. Um, Councilor, as far as I posed the question to you, that was your response. I, I don't want to take your time if you wanted to continue. I lowered my hand. Okay, great. <laughs> I, I lowered my hand because you asked me the question and gave me the yeah. opportunity to speak, so okay. I lowered it. Thanks. All right, thanks. Uh, Chief, can I, I mean, and certainly I take no issue with the points Councilor Esparza makes about payday lending. I, I was involved in those fights as well, and I, I thought they were um, very exploitative uh, and still are. Quite often, but but chief, just about the the investigations. I mean, I can remember, boy, being a very young prosecutor. <laughs> hard to believe I was young. Uh, on the bat team back in the DA's office, and we had I remember a burglary detective who used to do sweeps at 
at the at the flea market once a week, um, looking for Prince property. And there were a couple other retail spots that weren't pawn shops; they were just retailers um, that we just knew where the Prince property was going to go. And so, I, I mean, this is not this is not unique. I assume. Oh, you're you're, you're right, uh, Mayor. In that uh, pawn shops is one, the flea market uh, was another. And then uh, we also conducted uh, special operations, right? Where yeah. uh, our officers um, you know, uh, were uh, undercover. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilman Rakan? Yeah, um, just a couple of questions, I guess. Um, I understand and I certainly uh, agree with, this, with what Councilmember Sparza was saying about the issues with pawn shops. I'm just trying to understand what this um, change would actually materially do for that problem. Um, you said there's, uh, I think Jared, you said there's six, four locations and two uh, applications, which would fill our six. Um, those applications are in locations, uh, you, you made it sound like those applications would still be accepted, right? I mean, we're not changing the outcome of those applications by this ordinance change, are we? Um, the the licenses are pending. The the um, from my understanding, the location of those um, license, uh, the pending license, um, are on uh, on Story Road. So it is possible that the that this ordinance could trigger the the new findings for those um, for those licenses, depending on where they are in the process. So it's possible that perhaps one of the two pending licenses would be denied if this change were adopted tonight? Um, yes, it could be. That that could be possible, or at least at minimum, they would need to make, you know, there's the additional finding. So what doesn't necessarily, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily prevent a pawn shop uh, business from locating in a, a particular site where it'd be allowed, but they would have to make, me, uh, meet those additional findings. Uh, the one exception would be if you end up with three within a thousand feet and basically like two of those are within 500 feet of each other, um, then that uh, the a pawn shop business could not move forward. You couldn't have, under the proposed ordinance, you could not have a, a concentration um, of pawn shops uh, in that manner. Given that the first four locations are pretty seem fairly spread out, um, and these, I'm just trying to figure out what we're gaining by this change right now. If we already have an ordinance that says we can't have more than six pawn shops in the entire city, um, and the outstanding the, the licenses that are there would, um, the licenses that are already being reviewed would give us those six. I mean, I, unless the, the goal here is that in the future, if the future council were to increase the number above six, then this would help keep them spread out. Is that the idea? I'm just trying to understand the value of moving forward. I mean, I tend to agree with Councilmember Davis when she says the planning commission had a point because there's, there's only four and there's, only a, there's a six max. So what is the, the reason for proceeding with this? Right. Are you asking me or yeah. asking Jerry? Whoever wants to answer it, I guess it's okay. I don't know. I'll say it's a proliferation. In case of a proliferation, which under current rules couldn't occur. Prolifer I'm sorry? Can under you say that again? Under current rules, the proliferation couldn't occur because we have a limit of six. So you're saying in case. No, a proliferation in one impacted neighborhood. So an over uh, overrepresented in an area, right? It's to keep them spread out. Concentration. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Thank I understand you. Concentration. I understand Thank you. Concentration. I guess my question is, you know, can we have a concentration given the current city regulations on the numbers and the limit? Right. I, I guess I don't see that as a, a as a possibility given that we you're saying we already have a limit of six total in the whole city. I think if you're in that neighborhood and you're seeing the impacts, it's a proliferation. Yeah, which neighborhood? And you're talking about the story road. So the two that are on that are. So this is about preemptive for these two licenses. That, that was the question I was asking, Jared. I mean, if, if these if these two are not within a thousand feet, then what will this materially change by passing this ordinance? My understanding is that the uh, so the two the proposed uh, new 
like on shop businesses were proposing to go in the the same building is one of the uh the current pawn shop businesses on um story road and so yeah the purpose you know of the of this ordinance would be to prevent the you know the concentration of both you know not only this to the six that the city currently allows and then if in the future this you know hypothetically if the city were to allow more than six pawn shops then um the the ordinance would um look at you know the, the purpose there is to address the over concentration of those pawn shops in one location but so does that sound like this could have an immediate impact on app on license applications that are actually currently filed with the city that's correct okay uh, i think i guess that answers my question can i just follow up on that jared so does two constitute an over concentration in one site just trying to understand how this works um no so uh under the the proposed ordinance um it would basically uh how the ordinance would work it would you know preventing for preventing over concentration um so if a pawn broker if a proposed pawn broker is within 500 feet of another pawn broker uh, it can't result in a total of more than three pawn brokers within a thousand feet of each other if, okay. if, if that makes sense and then um, so you could have two within the same shopping center right you could have two and then and then if a proposed location res results in three pawn brokers with within a thousand foot radius but you know but they're not located within that 500 feet buffer then additional findings are needed not to, sorry, not to additional findings things. are needed if you get to the three yeah so right? if, so if you had one proposed you know that if, if there was a proposed location that resulted in three within like a thousand foot radius of each That's other you need additional findings. yeah you would need additional findings um if, if there weren't low you know if, if two basically weren't located within 500 feet because okay. at that point then the ordinance restricts it if, if you can't have three within a thousand feet and then two of them within 500. okay well, i guess i'm coming around to the new customer calling i'm not sure it'll make a difference but okay. All right. Well, um, all right. Other comments? All right. We will then. Um, there's a motion of Councilmember Sparzo. Let's vote on that motion. Jimenez? No. Corrales? Yes. Cohen? No. Roscoe? Carrasco? Davis? No. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? No. Mahan? No. Jones? Yes. Ricardo? Uh, no. Um, going back to Carrasco? Marking absent. So I have six no's. All right, uh, we'll move on then to item uh, 10.3, which is general plan amendment site development permit for a property located at 276 Lost Way. There's a presentation on this item. Um, we're not able to hear anyone if someone's trying to speak. <laughs> Is that Jared or Robert? No. Yeah, man. I think Robert's just teeing up the presentation. He'll right. tell. <laughs> jump it in any minute now. Just preparatory moment. Got it.
It's Robert. I'm trying to share my screen. So we can see the screen pretty well. Oh, okay. So good evening, Mayor and Councilman Robert Manford, Deputy Director uh, for Planning. So the item before you uh, is a general plan amendment to change the general plan land use designation from quasi from quasi public to downtown on a 3.08 acre site. Uh, it also entails a site development permit to allow the construction of 220 uh, story office towers with approximately 1.8 million square feet, including uh, 10,107 gross feet ground floor area spaces and 122 1.2 million gross square feet of commercial office space with four levels of subterranean parking and four levels of above grade parking and to allow the demolition of 11 single family residences and five detached garages. Uh, the demolition of five single family homes that are contributors to a candidate city landmark district and the removal of 30 ordinary size trees and 21 ordinary size trees uh, on a 2.9 gross acre site within 3.08 acres gross total site. As you can see from the map, uh, the existing general plan land use designation is uh, public, quasi-public, and then the proposed land use designation will be downtown designation. With regards to site clearance, The project entails demolition of 11 single family homes and five detached garages. It will demolish five single family homes that are contributors to a candidate landmark shown in yellow over here on the map, on the site plan, and then the removal of 30 ordinary size trees and 21 ordinary size trees. Uh, upon site clearance, uh, the 20 story. Uh, Two 20 story towers will be developed, 1.8 million square foot total. Uh, and then in 10, it will include 10,107 square feet of ground floor retail space, 35 foot riparian setback, and a passive connecting South Almaden Boulevard and Guadalupe River Trail Walkway, as you can see from the uh, renderings. And EIR was prepared for the Project and it went out for public review on March 1st, 2021 through April 15, 2021. The EIR concluded that the project will result in significant and unavoidable impacts to cultural resources. As a result, the City Council will have to adopt a statement of overriding considerations for cultural resources. Six written comment letters were received during the public review period of the EIR. All the comments have been responded to in full, but none of them raised any issue of uh, any flaw with regards to the EIR sufficiency. Staff has three recommendations to make. Uh, first is the adoption of the resolution to certify the EIR, including findings and then uh, adoption of statement of overriding considerations and mitigation measures. Uh, second is the adoption of the resolution amending the Vision San Jose 2020 General Plan Land Use Transportation Diagram designation from public quasi public to downtown on an approximately 3.08 gross acre site. And lastly, the adoption of a resolution approving the project subject to conditions, uh, a site development permit to allow the construction of 20 story foot tower with a total of approximately 1.85 million square feet and all the other components of the project as previously described. This concludes staff presentation, will be available to answer any questions and then the project applicant is also present. Thank you. All right, uh, is the applicant here? They'd like to present. Yes, Mr. Tessine is in the attendee yeah. section. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Mr. Tresini, if you'd like to speak, if you please raise your hand and we'll go to the applicant before we go to the public. Okay, Mr. Tresini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Members of the council, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. 
Uh, appreciate the uh, overview uh, from Robert Manford of the, of the project and, and the staff's uh, support of the project uh, throughout the uh, three years that we've been uh, working on this project uh, moving forward. I want to uh, take time to uh, thank our project planner uh, who was assigned to the project, Angela Wang, along with Robert Manford's team, uh, Adam Peterson and Ty Lee, uh, for the excellent job that they have demonstrated throughout the process and uh, through the environmental review. I do have uh, just a very brief presentation. I want to be respectful of the council's time. It's been a long afternoon for, for everyone. Yeah, but I, I believe it would be important for the council to have a, an overview from our architectural team, C2K Architects. Um, I believe they've done a phenomenal job with this uh, project, and I believe it will really enhance the, um, the goals of the general plan and the efforts that have been made by this council, and particularly Raul Perales with the downtown efforts that he has uh, pushed forth uh, over the last uh, few years. So if uh, Tim Boylan can give us a, a brief overview, he's with C2K Architecture along with uh, Nathan Miller. Tim, go ahead. Thank you, Mark. Uh, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay, excellent. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Everybody see this? Yes. Um, so, so looking at this site specifically, um, I think what really stood out to us is the complexity that um, the complexity of the site and the amount of influences we're working with. Um, so specifically, we had two highways um, that were right at the intersection of. Um, we're at the southernmost tip of downtown, so we're sort of the tip of the spear. Um, of the downtown, the urban core, the downtown core. Um, we're all, we also serve as a boundary marker um, between downtown and the transects surrounding it. So thinking about these influences we have on the site, um, we really wanted to focus in on how this could be a unique part of the city of San Jose. Um, what stood out to us looking at the current skyline is that um, it's really dominated by a strong horizontal demising line. Um, and a lot of that is dictated by height limitations set by the airport. Um, so what we saw this project as really an opportunity um, to create a focal point within the city of San Jose skyline. Um, so whereas the majority of the buildings end in a horizontal line, ours uh, contradicts that. It, it chooses to have a curvilinear form on its roof line, really creating this iconic form, um, this iconic landmark uh, form. It's also a gateway site for the city, so this is again a, a composition, a design that really serves as that iconic skyline form. And we've continued that through the rest of the design as well. You can see the roof line of the building at, uh, curves, ebbs, and flows, and then it cascades down to the ground. We've created a we've divided the site into two individual towers to give it a sleek profile, thinning them up. Um, and trying to, try to make this dynamic curving form respond to its context. Um, this is along the backside um, by the river. Um, again, thinking about how we're responding to our context, how do we um, create a space for this river walk? Aerial view of that. Um, and also creating an activated plaza um, in between the two buildings. And also responding to our context. And so, really carving back as much of our, of our building as we can to respond to uh, the context we're, that we're surrounding. Um, also creating a dynamic architectural form that kind of gives this cascading water feeling to it. Um, and also uh, grand entrances, really world-class architecture, architectural design sort of elements, um, focusing on creating this uh, really great experience. Um, looking at our floor plans, most of our parking is below ground. Um, this is a, the first floor, uh, level one, the ground floor. Um, moving up to level two, you can see we do have some above ground parking. Um, moving up to level three, again, level four, level five, um, and then these are the typical office floors. Um, and you can see that dynamic form uh, folds into the uh, floor plans as well. 
Um, it's all sort of this uh, dynamic form that we're pursuing. Um, and we'd be happy to take any questions about the design. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go to the public first and then we'll come back to the council. Uh, Tessa. All right, thank you. Tessa Woodmancy. Uh, well, it sounded like public land is going to be taken for this, and that is horrific. That's what we've been dealing with all around our neighborhoods. Um, I was thinking about um, the land at uh, Lincoln, Lincoln High School that the Future Farmers of America was taken away for development of housing. And then, you know, uh, Emma Prush Park, you know, the, you know, we think we have a great park, but actually they took two thirds of it or so to put the highway there. So we've taken a lot of public lands uh, that have been uh, granted for public, you know, for keeping agriculture. And we need to keep our lands um, for, for agriculture really. And, and we keep um, developing high rises. And like, I, like it says, you know, you can't eat money and you can't drink diesel. And, you know, these are the things that, these are the problems that we're facing is food insecurity. And we're, the way we're, you know, our general. Uh, Blair? Hi, thank you. I, I think this was the project that was uh, brought to the planning uh, commission a few weeks ago. Um, thanks for the words, Atessa. Um, I, I didn't say it well enough at the time, but um, I, if, if, if needed, can you consider uh, taking down maybe 25 to 50 feet of this building? Uh, it can be a, an important option for yourselves if there'll be environmental issues and safety issues with the airplanes in the future. And just to simply say it, hopefully can help uh, where needed. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Robert and Gary. Yeah, Robert Aguirre here. Uh, yeah, I also have some concern. Uh, I, I don't know if this is all commercial uh, office space that, that or there's going to be any residential in here. I'm also concerned about the number of unhoused people that are going to be moved out of the area that, that are now. There's no consideration for that and for uh, finding a, an alternate place for those people to go. Uh, you know, it's great that we're expanding the city and trying to make ourselves more like San Francisco, I guess, uh, but at what cost? And we need to seriously have an opportunity for unhoused people to have a voice in what's going on other than, uh, you know, just community outreach to people that, uh, that own property or live in that area that can uh, come in and speak. Uh, there, there's a large number of people that are being left out of this discussion. And again, I, I implore you to uh, reach out to this population as much as possible. Thank you, Robert. Hi, uh, Roland. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just cannot tell you how excited about, I am about this, um, you know, um, iconic building and, and how much I really appreciate the extra effort and effort and resources the developers put in designing something that's going to be better than the average, you know, square box we see in uh, downtown San Jose. And looking forward, I hope that the um, planning department will use this as an example uh, that they can set for the other developers so they can start uh, doing better elsewhere in downtown San Jose. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brenda? Hi, um, I just want to say that I am concerned how we are taking 11 single house homes and demolishing them for this corporate, because this seems like it's going to be corporate office space. I would love to see more than six comments on this. These are 11 homes. I want to see um, what is has been done because once again, planning commissions just rubber stamping these projects and I don't feel that they're doing their work as to ask these questions and it's concerning to me. Um, we, are, we just saw the flea market got gentrified and again, Eric is here representing uh, another gentrification project and I hope you're really proud of that. Um, you guys might think that you can continue to gentrify our places, but just know that you know, you're gonna gentrify your own grandkids as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, returning to, oh, just one more hand. Paul Soto. 
<laughs> man, this is all I know, man. This is all, that's all I know, man. That's all I got. That's my barrio, man. My tia, my, my tia lived in that one of those houses when I was a kid. Man, this is all I have is that barrio. And you're stripping it from me. You are showing me your dominance and your power. You are stripping me and making me feel impotent, powerless, and helpless. That's my value, man. That's all I got. That shaped me. It molded me. Everything that I am is in that value right there. I gave everything. My mother and father went to Woodrow Wilson. Man, this guy. It's got to stop, man. Please stop. Stop this. Just stop, man. I'm serious. Just please stop. I'm turning to the council. Council member Frost. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Uh, that's a difficult uh, commentary to follow up, um, but I will do my, my best here. So, um, First off, I want to say thank you to staff for, for all the work on this. Um, and this is certainly a, a unique location where it's um, very difficult to try and put in new development. And specifically because of the, the need to, to um, accumulate different parcels. And when uh, the developer first came to me and expressed their interest, uh, for me, that was one of the most important things was, was you know, could they actually identify enough of the, the properties in the area to make a, uh, a meaningful development? And um, it, was, it was challenging, I know, to say the least, but um, all but the one property was able to be uh, identified where they could, they could actually make a deal with the, the current uh, property owners. And I will say that the, all the single family homeowners, besides that one, uh, so all the ones that will be displaced, uh, agreed to, to be bought out on their, their single family property, uh, likely uh, more of an opportunity than they would have had beforehand um, on, on those, those properties, because uh, without the, a, a project pooling together all the different properties here, uh, it's very unlikely that we would have gotten any kind of development in the area. And for a downtown core parcels, um, this current land use of the single family homes uh, was certainly not at, at its highest and best use. I would agree that, um, you know, we, we obviously want to see housing projects come in, but we also want to see more jobs coming into the downtown. And that's why we allow for both jobs or housing to go into the downtown zoning. Uh, we, don't, we don't dictate that on these, these high rises. Um, and so in this case, certainly we have a benefit of getting um, a, a number of new jobs, which uh, can, can greatly benefit uh, the, the downtown core. And, and this of anywhere is where we want to be able to, to build as dense and high as possible. That has been uh, our goal as we're, we're moving forward with development in the downtown core and uh, to comments around around trying to, to lower that density. This is not the areas where we want to lower it. We're, we're, we're under the, the FAA safety guidelines of height. So we're, we're certainly uh, well within where, where we should be and what a safe uh, height would be. I would say that the, the last um, piece for me was a hope that, that that one final home that you might have seen in the, the images uh, would also um, be brought into the project. Uh, my office did make contact with the homeowner there. It sounds as though uh, they they have some issues with um, how the, the property is owned and, and was acquired um, and, uh, and that that might be uh, an, an, an issue for them in regards to, I believe, a, 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 a trust um, and somebody granted a life estate on, on that property. But I do believe they have some interest. They have been um, in contact with the developer, and, and it could even be possible that that last parcel uh, gets brought into into the project as well, which would be my hope. 
If not, uh, the, I know that there is a lot of sensitivity around that project as you've, or of that home, as you've seen within the project on ensuring that the development uh, adjacent to it uh, is not as high as the, re the other two towers, as well as my understanding is from the developer, uh, they will be monitoring so that that way this, this particular property, if it does uh, exist through the, de through the development uh, stage that it is not impacted. Um, and, and have monitoring down to the details of, of cracks in the foundation and, and uh, things that will be important for that for that house if it is going to remain. Otherwise, I, I thank uh, KT Urban, uh, Mark, and, and your willingness to invest in this uh, location to be able to, uh, to pull together a, a project uh, that meets what we want to see within our downtown core, the uh, inclusion of things like the bird safe uh, glass uh, on the project as well. Um, and with that, I'll move approval. Second. All right, there's a motion and a second. Just had a couple quick questions. Uh, Chris or Robert, uh, if ultimately they're able to um, come to an agreement with that remaining property owner, is there anything this doesn't have to come back to us for another revision of the GPA, does there? I mean, they, they, they can still move forward or they have to actually come back here if they're gonna to wanna to change the design. May I, uh, this is Robert Manford. It depends on whether it will change the design and whether it will trigger a discretionary action. Huh. Is there anything we can do to be able to give them the flexibility so they can come to an agreement with that property owner and move ahead if they need to? It is my understanding, or I know that the EIR went, uh, was addressed, uh, assuming that uh, that site could be developed. Okay. So the, the envelope was large enough to incorporate that square footage and so forth. That's correct. Perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and I guess, you know, to prevent a reenactment of the movie Up, um, I, you know, I know in LA, they, they had a, a way to time zoning in ways to encourage aggregation of parcels. And I'm just wondering, is there anything we can do from the city standpoint to encourage agreement in this way between property owners. I'm, I'm recalling from something that happened like a decade ago and some developer down there was telling them me how they did it. I have no idea if it works or not. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah Mary, I think I recall reading something about it. Um, I'd have to go back and look at it a little bit more, but I think it's a reasonable question. Uh, something we want to pay a little bit more attention to as we see more sites like this uh, around the periphery of downtown. Okay. Well, I, I'm frankly, I'm amazed because I, that this is, uh, has gotten uh, so far as it has, it's obviously uh, very challenging uh, being able to persuade that many individual property owners to, to go forward. So I appreciate the, um, a pretty pretty bold statement. I, I, I appreciate also the sentiment many have, which is this is obviously a neighborhood much like my own, um, about a hundred years old, and and many of those homes I know have been around, and obviously a rich part of our history and our city. In fact, I know my mother's father actually lived in a in a home just within a couple blocks of here that was ultimately bulldozed for the for the freeways, um, and and that's where he spent his childhood. Uh, the reality is, though, this is a site that is really at the intersection of two freeways right in the middle of our downtown. And I think uh, it was inevitable that there was going to be some very significant urban scale development here. Um, and obviously, uh, Sir Gersini, um, was, uh was willing to take a very substantial risk to, to try something like this. And, and I think it is a beautiful design. I think it will be a beautiful addition. And, I trust that there were um, arm lanes negotiations that resulted in, in those individual property owners feeling content that they got the benefit of their bargain. Uh, and so we'll be able to move forward. Um, I know that there are some efforts underway to see how some of these homes can be relocated to other sites. And 
if Mr. Tersini is with us, I was just hoping to find out if there was any update about whether it was successful with any of those relocations. Mayor Licardo, um, one, we're very fortunate. One of the property owners that um, owns uh, land uh, within the Rosway development happens to have a site that is at uh, Gifford in West San Fernando. We've had our civil engineer uh, lay out uh, four of the homes that could work there. And it's really a, a matter of whether or not that's something that the uh, city staff would support uh, as, as this property owner would move forward uh, to do that. They could make an excellent um, uh, secondary or ADU units as part of his uh, property. So that is that is an opportunity um, and we'll, we will pursue that. Got to figure out a way to get those houses over the 87. Maybe it, maybe up is a good idea. Fortunately, fortunately there are single story units and so hopefully they'll go underneath the, uh, the overpass. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, no, it's not easy. So thank you for considering those options. All right, uh, I'm happy to support the, the motion. Any other comments? Let's vote. Mayas? Yes. Rallis? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Crosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Esparza? Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Going back to Esparza? Parking absent. Thank you. All right. Uh, item 10.6 is a city initiated conforming rezoning for properties located at Sierra Road, Miracle Mountain Drive, and Casa Loma Road. There is no presentation. We'll take public comment on this item only. Tessa? Okay, this item only, just rezoning. Um, basically, I guess let's see what it's saying. Um, city initiative conforming rezoning, Sierra Road. Okay, so um, basically, you know, I, what Paul, Paul uh, Soto was saying, please stop, please stop. I mean, those words were very powerful. Appreciate Raul Perala noticing that. And, you know, it's like, this is the issue of when are we going to stop when the science is saying we need transformational change and our processes, that means our planning and how we're going forward with our city. So, you know, this, you know, conforming rezoning, um, I'm not exactly sure what that's about in this particular situation, but we see the orientation of our city for commercial development and everything is about jobs when really the only thing that's going to be, you know, left for us if we survive. Uh, Paul Soto. Yeah, Council, all I ask from you as a descendant from Sasu Puedes and as, as a person that has to go through his own mourning process, I, all I ask is for, for some uh, 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 latitude. That's all I ask from the Council. Get, let, let, just let me go through my process. I'll be fine. But just let me go through because Look, man, I don't have any kids. I don't have any kids. I don't have nothing. I don't have anything except the city. That's why I spend, I spend 30 hours a week here, along with another 25 hours a week at least in research. Every single week I do this. You guys see this. So all I'm asking is just give me a little latitude and hear me out. Because this, the redlining and what happened to me what happened to all these Chicanos here in San Jose? These Chicanos suffered greatly, man. I, I just, I can't believe the apathy. Okay, uh, returning to the council. Forgive me, was there a motion? I'll move approval. Second. All right, let's vote on the motion. Menez? Yes. Rallis? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Rosco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? 
Aye. Ricardo. Aye. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the last item on the last agenda of the fiscal year and the last council meeting of uh, city manager Dave Sykes career. Uh, as a former president once said, Dave, you won't have us to kick around anymore. Um, let's go to public comment. Tessa. Thank you, Tessa Woodmancy. I am interested in that project that um, they were saying that there's houses that need to be uh, find a home. And at our uh, location at 615, we've been talking about receivership. And, you know, we looked at some properties that Google was trying to relocate. I guess I'm going to have to find out who that uh, development is and contact them. Or maybe, you know, I could speak to our city and they could connect us with that because that was an idea is to bring housing there, maybe three houses to go on that, that lot that there would be in a semicircle and have a food production in the middle as a resilient, uh, as a model for resiliency where neighbors help each other, neighbors helping neighbors and uh, growing food together. But that needs to be the model of how we go forward. And um, it, that's just an idea that they were looking for a place besides the other ideas we have for the 615 to actually be a, a community garden. Thank you, Paul Soto. Uh, again, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Sykes, for 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 bringing the for bringing that meeting where what happened to my mother and my father in this city was at least given its its proper due. Because people don't listen to us, man. People just don't care about this. The bullet's already been fired. I'm already dead. Do you know that? The policies that happened here, the bullet's been fired. I just I just haven't fell to the ground yet, but I'm dead. And so we're at least 100,000 Chicanos and Mexicanos in this city in the next five years. We're dead. The shot's already been fired. And that is the reality. I just, I, I'm just, I'm just incredulous. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm all right. Thank you, Mr. Soto. Uh, Mr. Soto, I hope you take care of yourself. You know, this has been a very difficult time. Uh, Blair. Hi, thanks. Uh, Blair Beekman, happy end of the fiscal year. We're here, um, or the state fiscal year. Um, I hope uh, to think of some words that Paul Soto and I were both thinking of. I hope you can work on the ideas of, uh, uh, you know, gaming tables. Uh, th those do need yearly reports about the crime issues, not just around the tables, but how they contribute to crime in the city. I think that you have to work on the yearly reports. Work on, uh, you know, and some last words to uh, David Sykes, um, you know, work on open public policy ideas. They're the ideas that, uh, you know, it's a good organizational model to take care of ourselves in times of adversity. Like I've been saying, things have been really closed lately. Uh, it can help in times of adversity, open public policy can. And good luck with flea market issues. Uh, try to think of the history of the flea market, allow people to help design the flea market. And, and Thank you. Rowan? Good evening, Mayor and Council, and thank you for your service at this late hour. I would like to follow up on last night's Charter Commission meeting, specifically the discussion we had about the Pound Act and public participation in subcommittee uh, meeting discussion. The bottom line is that, contrary to the city attorney's opinion, these subcommittees are indeed subject to the Brown Act. And the reason, the real reason they're not open to the public is that the city clerk, clerk's office does not have sufficient resources to agendize and provide staff and consultant support to these subcommittee meetings. In closing, I hope that you, as our elected official, will rise to the occasion and ensure that there are sufficient resources uh, allocated to this uh, transform transformative process. Uh, thank you and good night. Thank you. Robert Aguirre. 
Yeah, Robert Aguirre here. Uh, yeah, I feel for Paul Soto and and all the his, you know his family relationships and all the other uh, Latinos in in the neighborhood that that are being pushed out. Uh, and also, uh, again, I implore you to try to put together a commission of people of the unhoused. Uh, there's too many decisions that are being made that affect them, and they don't involve them in these decisions. And uh, I think uh, you know by now that this is where my heart is, my passion. And I, I try to take care of these, these people, and, and they're constantly being just thrown about. Uh, you know, what's going on over in the airport area, what's going on and, and through a lot of areas in the city where where people are being pushed out and that number is going to grow. And we know that, you know that. And we need to start thinking more clearly about how to handle all these people that are being pushed out and uh, try to provide them a, a better opportunity. So please think about putting together that commission. Thank you. Uh, Andrea Case. My name is Andrea Case. I'm a city employee for almost 15 years and a D10 resident. I'm calling to ask for a wage that respects my work. For this past year, I've worked in the Emergency Operations Center. I've shown up for my community, my coworker, finding hotels for exposed staff, supervising and conducting health screenings. The city council has said that you appreciate the work that others in the community have done by voting for hazard pay for grocery workers. And it's hurtful and disrespectful while your own workforce, the backbone of your city is keeping the city running. We're the ones that implement your initiatives and run the programs that your constituents attend. A 3% raise doesn't pay the rent. It doesn't pay for my daughter's aftercare. It doesn't allow me to save for a rainy day. I'm asking for the respect and the pay that I deserve. I'm sure the police officers earlier appreciated the thank yous and they appreciated their pay a lot more. Thank you. <laughs> Brenda Sandejas. Hi, um, I just want to speak for all the people that were there today picketing outside City Hall. Um, they are city workers. They have risked their lives to keep essential services running and to give them a 3% raise that's not equitable in San Jose. As rents are sky high and everything keeps going up, electricity, water, and you name it. That is not okay. We call them the heroes, but we're not giving them what they deserve. So I'm here standing in solidarity with them. And I also have another comment. Our flea market vendors have been displaced. You guys have gentrified them. I do wanna request the city to find at least three locations where you can settle um, for them to be and you displace them, please help them find a location. And I hope that it gets agendized. You get at least three locations where they can choose from. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> returning to the council. Uh, Councilmember Carrasco. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just, I guess, just a, a few words. It's our last session, and uh, and uh, we'll be back in August, uh, back in council. <laughs> you won't hear my dogs, um, <laughs> but uh, but I'm just compelled by by Paul Soto's words. Shh, stay up. Uh, by Paul Soto's words, because uh, I'm very familiar with that neighborhood, of course. Those were some of the better years of my life. As a child, my, my, my parents uh, moved to that area and they raised me up until I was uh, 11, 12 years old and my parents worked in the cannery. So uh, I have a lot of very fond memories there. And, and it's, it's, it really is very painful to see the city grow up. You, you, you know, there's a lot of mixed emotions. You want your city to grow up. You also want it uh, to stay the same. Um, but more importantly, you want to make sure that that your folks are are taken care of, and and uh, and we've been talking here extensively over this past year, especially during the pandemic, on how how uh, the the pandemic has really uh, allowed us to 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 go into this with eyes wide open. We see 
where the injustices have been uh, truly uh, laid out, uh, we can't deny it. And, uh, and, and so uh, I, I hear Paul loud and clear. I, I hear the pain, uh, it, it's undeniable. And, uh, and I just want to uh, reassure Paul that even as the wheels of progress, and I say progress very loosely, Paul, uh, as they turn, uh, know that, uh, that you've got allies on this council who are looking to see how we, how we ease that, uh, that bitter pill and how we, can, uh, how we can find a soft landing. So, uh, so as things are changing and, and they, they change, um, uh, let's see how we can work collectively so that we can also make, uh, make room for everybody. C uh, the city of San Jose has to continue to be a city of immigrants, uh, a city where our, our, our parents, our grandparents, and our children uh, feel that it belongs to them. We built the city just like our, uh, uh, our Italian communities, our Portuguese communities, our Vietnamese communities, uh, our Filipino communities, uh, all, all came in uh, and really saw the promise of what San Jose had to offer. And so uh, uh, I look forward to continuing to hear your voice in our discussions, in our conversations, uh, and, and see you back at City Hall in August. But, uh, but please, let's, uh, let's make sure to take care of each other uh, in these next coming weeks. Uh, and and, and uh, just, just, just take care of yourself. Thank you, Councilman. It's very well said. I hope everyone takes care of themselves. Uh, and uh, Dave, thank you again for your, for your service. Everyone take care. Thank you, everyone.